I'd like to call this meeting to order for the City Council meeting of November 5th, 2019. Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Here. Councilmember Moe? Here. Councilmember Soto? Here. Councilmember Waterfield? Here. Madam Mayor Patino? Here. As there are no proclamations this, this evening, the first item on our agenda will be the public comment period. Madam Clerk, could you please read the criteria for the public comment period portion of the agenda? This time is reserved to accept comments from the public on consent agenda items, closed session items, or matter not, matters not otherwise scheduled on the printed agenda this evening. Unless otherwise directed by the mayor, speakers will have three minutes to comment. Direction to staff may be given. However, state law does not allow action to be taken by the city council on matters not on the printed agenda. Once the com public comment period commences, no other speakers will be allowed to submit a request to speak form. Madam Mayor, we have 25 requests to speak. 25 requests to speak, okay. So this is gonna be a long meeting tonight without this. So if you could keep your comments to two minutes instead of the regular three. And are there any that on a different subject than this? Okay. 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 So um, at this point, no one else will be allowed to speak after all the speaker slips are in, and there will be two minutes. Please keep to the two minutes because when that buzzer go off, goes off, I would ask you to leave the podium. Kathy Hayes, followed by Jeffrey Hall, followed by William Wagner. Madam Mayor, City Council, for the past 10 years, the Freedom Warming Centers have been providing emergency overnight shelter to homeless individuals during winter months when weather conditions can be life-threatening. We're the only warming center serving Santa Barbara County, activating Carpinteria, Santa Barbara, Lompoc, and Santa Maria. Like warming centers around the country, our activation season is November 15th to March 31st. And like cities around California, we initiate an activation overnight weather conditions or triggers as we call them. When temperatures reach 35 degrees or below, there's a 50% chance of rain. For years, the Salvation Army has been our host site partner, allowing us to use a facility on those nights when triggers are met. About three weeks ago, the um, Salvation Army informed us we would not be able to use their facility on weeknight, weekend nights. Weeknights are perfectly fine, but weekends no longer work for their schedule. The past few days, I've had communication with Mr. Stillwell about the possible use of a community center for potential overnight weekend hours. Uh, Mr. Uh, my communication with Mr. Stillwell is transferred to Mr. Posada, which makes complete sense as Director of Parks and Recreation. This afternoon, I was notified by Mr. Posada the use of any Santa Maria Community Center for a potential overnight weekend activation was not a viable option. Right now, with this late notice from the Salvation Army, we're in a crunch to find a possible location that meets the requirements for operation operating a warming center, which is why we turned to the city. Cities around the country provide warming centers a place to host an activation. Roy Grande and the Tascadero's use facility, city facilities. Last year, Santa Barbara County issued a report on homelessness and deaths. The final report showed that not one homeless individual has died in Santa Barbara County during the winter months due to weather-related conditions. We're doing our job. To be clear, we work in numerous Santa Maria nonprofits and- Thank you, Kathy. Uh, we hope you'll reconsider. Jeffrey Hall, followed by William Wagner, followed by Paul Kirk. Good evening, Mr. Hall. Oh, good evening, Council, uh, Mayor and City Council. Thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, I'm the uh, Vice President of the NAACP here in San Maria and Long Pole. Uh, Lawanda couldn't be here because tonight we have our regular meeting also, so she's uh, chairing that. Uh, I'm, here to, I'm here to support the NAACP and we support uh, the implementation of Proposition 47 and 57. And also, we believe that Chief Hansen and the men and women of the police department here in San Maria, uh, San Maria have done an outstanding job and are doing an outstanding job. However, uh, in the, since the, uh, the servicing of this uh, this video, uh, we believe there should be body cams uh, for, for all the staff officers here in San Maria along with implicit bias training. And uh, that's our uh, position on that. We don't 
believe there should be an investigation until the facts have come out. So thank you very much. Thank you. William Wagner, followed by Paul Kirk, followed yeah. by Daniel Swanson. Thank you, I'm William Wagner, uh, host of On Second Talk Television, and I want to briefly mention it's none of your fault. None of you up there, whether you're Democrat, Republican, or independent, it's none of your faults that we have homeless here. Something I want to mention when I was here last month. The reason we have homeless is because we have a Federal Reserve system that creates money out of thin air, constantly devaluing the working man's income. So it doesn't matter what you raise the minimum wage, they will rapidly devalue that, and they still won't be able to afford it. So it's none of your fault. You have to get rid of the Federal Reserve System, which President Trump at one point promised he would do, as well as putting Hillary in prison. I'm still waiting to see those promises come to pass. But what I mainly came down to talk to you about, my main issue is the public access television studio has been falling apart for years. It was all brand new about 14, 15 years ago, and the maintenance has not been done. You just got a whole bunch of new equipment that's going to make the transmission really good, but what we really need, and I just told the general manager before the meeting started, which I've been trying to do for a month, we need playback machines to play the mini DV tape, which almost all producers record their master shows on so they can play it back or have content. We have three of them in there. Two of them are broken, one is very iffy. I couldn't use it last Friday doing a live show. I could not use it, had to change everything I was doing to put on the air, even though there would be no playback and no one will see that show again. Get, spend 3,000 if you can still find a brand new playback machine. <laughs> Invest in that, because that is key. And the other thing is open up to public access at least 30 hours a week. Somebody's in there 30 hours a week, whether we're able to do production or not. I'm done, thank you. Thank you. Paul Kirk, followed by Daniel Swanson, followed by Lisa Toke. Madam Mayor, Council, staff, I'm representing 413 people tonight from Casa Grande Mobile Home Park. Those are the individuals that have signed their lease out of 420. Uh, we got a good lease negotiated with our owner this year, 10 years ago, and 10 years before that. We have practically the same lease three years, three times in a row. And the important part of that is we've had the opportunity to negotiate with our owner and in good faith, both sides came to a reasonable compromise on needs of residents as well as a reasonable <clears throat> share of profit for owner. Uh, I want to say that I've lived in the entire state of California uh, from the south to the north. I've lived here with my wife for 15 years. This was the best place to come for the inn, I might add. But Casa Grande Senior Mobile Home Park doesn't necessarily represent the end for all of us seniors. What it represents is an opportunity that we can collectively get together and make decisions that are good for us, for our families, and for our neighbors. And working on the uh, committee, the last two 10-year leases, and chairing the committee, not only did I meet a lot of people, but I heard a lot of comments. And I might add, the most important thing that came out of that deliberation with that committee for the Homeowners Association is a lot of people came forward and said, this is a very good lease, it's got good elements in it, and thank goodness we were able to negotiate a good lease. And I want to say one thing to the staff. I worked with the, with the stakeholder group for the last six to eight months. They've done an excellent job hearing us and given us the opportunity to work with owners and residents and come up with what I believe and I can support a good enforcement document as well as a good Thank model lease. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. Daniel Swanson, followed by Lisa Toke, followed by Bob Headley. <clears throat> Madam Mayor, esteemed council, uh, Mr. Watson, and of course, Mr. Stillwell. Uh, I really appreciate coming up tonight. First of all, I want to say negotiation. What's that? With the owner? No. No, he has all the power. We have to try to do the best that we can under the circumstances. Uh, the final model lease, it's been given to me and it's also was in the Santa Maria Times 
And that was the final negotiation with, was with Gary Hall and with Lisa Tokes, representing the owners. Uh, I can tell you this much, Gary Hall and I both totally disagree with it, and I say scrap it and go with the Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo rent stabilization. That's going to be far more fair to the residents, our senior citizens who can't afford it. Now, one of the things that we did get out of it is we've got the all Western states CPI. The owners have had an, in, an unfair advantage with the Los Angeles CPI, which goes up, up uh, this year a half a percent higher. Well, even with the all Western states, our elderly citizens in there are making far less on their Social Security. That's one. Number two, we had also agreed in there that vacancy control, that's one of the ways to have disproportionate space rent with two similar models. And the person who has the higher space rent has to sell it for a lot less. So we had agreed with the owner for 5% for every five years. I thought it was terrible, but I accepted it. Why are we having to pay for the fences? They're going to tell you, at least the Tokes will tell you, that was in the original agreement. But I can tell you, we own the home, but we don't own the land. So why is that? Uh, the, and finally, if we can't get to the point where we look at the rent stabilization that's already in place in Santa Barbara or San Luis Obispo, I would say this. Let's be fair to our senior citizens who are cutting out medicine and other things that are, is a prerequisite for them and that is a necessary item for them. Thank you, and, Mr. Swanson. Okay, and, Lisa, and, and cut it down to one and a half Lisa five. Toke, followed by Bob Headley, followed by Barry McGee. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, and city staff. My name is Lisa Toke, and I represent Rancho Buena Vista, Casa Grande, and Casa del Rio, the three biggest mobile home parks in Santa Maria. At the same time as we have been negotiating long-term leases with the residents of those three parks, we've also been negotiating the model lease and enforcement agreement package that will come before you on November 19th. We greatly appreciate the city's role in those negotiations as a facilitator. While neither side in any negotiation is ever happy, we believe that both sides can live with the model lease and enforcement agreement package especially since they're intended to be a backstop to the party's legal rights to contract with one another for their leases. We understand that there are some very vocal residents, Mr. Swanson included, who are not happy with the terms of the model lease and the enforcement package, but we'd like to point out that that package will not result in any costs to the city because those costs will be borne by the owners of the Bobo Home Parks um, in the event of a breach of the enforcement agreement. There's an attorney's fees provision in the enforcement agreement that calls for the owners in the event of a breach to be held responsible for those costs. And it is absolutely not, would not be the case that there will be no cost to the city if the city would enact a rent control ordinance. Instead, there would be significant costs to both the city and the residents of the parks of Santa Maria. My clients feel um, truly saddened by the fact that some of the residents of the senior mobile home parks in Santa Maria are struggling financially. But the reasons for those struggles are not anything that is my client's responsibility, and unfortunately, they do not have the power to fix those struggles. Thank you for your time both this evening and throughout this process. Bob Headley, followed by Barry McGee, followed by Gary Hall. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, and City Staff. My name is Bob Headley, and I'm here on behalf of Casa del Rio Mobile Estates, and we're one of the three major senior parks here in Santa Maria. Just a little background, my family has owned this park and developed this park 45 years ago, back in 1974, and we take great pride in it, and we've always looked at it as uh, an extension of people we care about, people in our community, and that's the way we've run the park. Um, also, our residents have been under long-term leases for decades. We've spent almost a year negotiating with, um, with the city. We also spent a year negotiating just about a year with our lease committee, and we came up with the lease committee and we thought was a fair lease, and we also think that the lease that the 
you know, your city staff's done a wonderful job working on this model lease because they dove into it. They understood the meat of what we were trying to accomplish. And I was very happy, very happy with their work. It was wonderful to see what happened. So as of uh, the end of September, we finalized our long-term <coughs> lease. And as of now, five weeks later, we have 75% of our residents have signed our long-term lease. So I want to thank you for this time this evening. And thank you, staff, for all your hard work. Barry, uh, uh, Bear, is it Barry, Barry McGee, followed by Gary Hall, followed by Jackie Narachi. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council, and City Staff. My name is Barry McGee, and I'm here on behalf of Rancho Buena Vista and Casa Grande. My family has owned both these parks since they were built, and we take great pride in both parks. Our residents have been under long-term leases for decades, and we have spent almost a year negotiating our January 1st, 2020 long-term lease with the residents and their lease committees. And we've also worked on the model lease with the city. Again, I'll reiterate what Bob said. It's been a tough struggle, and we have made many compromises in that, but we are happy with what staff has come up with and feel strongly that we should do that. Casa Grande residents starting has started signing their long-term leases in July, and Rancho Buena Vista residents starting their long-term leases last week. Between the two parks, we have 489 of the 630 leases now signed. And thank you for your time. Gary Hall, followed by Jackie Narachi, followed by Lois Sullivan. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. My name is Gary Hall. I'm a resident of Rancho Buena Vista, Mobile Estates, 2135 North Railroad Avenue. First, I want to once again acknowledge and thank all my fellow manufactured homeowners for being here. Raise your hand if you want to be acknowledged. My comments this evening are on behalf of them and the North Santa Barbara County Manufactured Home Team. Happy anniversary. It's been tomorrow, one year, since you, Madam Mayor, asked City Manager Stillwell to place enforceable rent stabilization on the council agenda. And if you have a look, we're still not on the agenda. All right? In September, we were told that the enforceable model lease 2020 would, not, would be on the agenda tonight, but that got pushed back to the next meeting. We finally received the enforcement agreement on the 23rd. That's eight days after the attorney for the owners presented it to the city, city attorney on October 15th. We were not even allowed an opportunity for a preliminary review. We find that disturbing. And now after our attorney's review, we are concerned about the legality of the agreement's content and its ability to provide the intended broad enforceability. In review, EML 2020 woefully lacks necessary provisions to meet our long-standing financial goals, and now it appears the agreement for enforcement is simply designed to endorse the park owner's desire for only offering long-term leases and to block any effort to introduce rent stabilization. One year passed, and leases of Rancho Buena Vista, Casa Grande, and Casa de Rio are expiring. La Maria is in limbo, and the remaining 11 or so mobile home parks remain ignored. Congratulations, park owners. Your stall tactics may have been successful. Only you, San Maria City Council, is empowered to make the changes we've Thank requested you, for so long, and we look forward to your response. Jackie Narachi, followed by Lois Sullivan, followed by Eileen Insinius. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, Mr. Stillwell, and Mr. Watson, before we agendize the hopeful, we hopefully agendize the RSO next, <laughs> the RSO at the next council meeting, I would like for you to consider a few questions we need answered or clarified. 
There are residents in Casa Grande and other parks who have already signed their leases thinking there was no alternative. Going to be, are they going to be offered the model lease? It was interesting that at the last council meeting, the powers that be could only find two residents who liked their lease. Of the 413 that signed, I have not met one that liked the lease. They felt they had no alternative. Okay. Were there other, why, excuse me, why wasn't our committee invited to participate in the drafting of the enforcement negotiations? If it wasn't for this committee in Gary Hall, there would be no model lease. We would not, we do not like the fact that we cannot pursue an ordinance and that there's no residence review of complaints. Looking at the final draft of the lease, will residents be offered our choice of either a five or 10 year term? The enforcement sets the term at 10 years, which is right. Thank you very much. Lois Sullivan, followed by Eileen Encinas, followed by Susan Kappa. Hello, and thank you for allowing me to speak. My name is Lois Sullivan. I live in Casa Grande. Um, I had this paper prepared, <coughs> but it doesn't mean anything. I've been listening to you all speak and listening to the homeowners. Our first thing I have to say, I highly resent what the Lady Lori said, uh, uh, I'm sorry, about the fact that because we don't have a lot of money, they're not responsible for it. That is an amazing thing to say, not that we expect them to be responsible for our lives. I supported our government in Vietnam. I've run operating rooms. I've been a teacher. What I've done in my life has been very positive. The fact that I don't have a lot of money, no, it's not your fault. But please do not say that you do not feel sorry for me because of anything like that. My life is my life. I'm here because I want to be. This rent stabilization we need. This, the lady was exactly right. People didn't know about the alternatives. Listen to the side who's being the most affected. The owners, guess what? They're gonna make money. I mean, come on, I'm not stupid. Neither is anybody here. This gentleman here who spoke, he's with the owners. Listen to Gary and the, the, we're not asking for a lot, but listen to what we need. Please listen to what we need. That is so important. There's a home, I, I've been reading about the homeless problem. You're gonna have a worse one if we can't remain in our homes. The mobile home parks are essential to Santa Maria and hopefully there will be even more because as people age, we need those. Not everybody has a ton of money. Not everybody can own everything, but that's life. We're just asking you to listen to Gary, listen to our needs and see the small things that we need to help us. It's not that big of a deal for the owners. It's an unbelievable deal for us that we need. I appreciate it. Thank you. Eileen Encinas, followed by Susan Kappa, followed by Esther Jensen. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Eileen Encinas from La Maria Mobile Home Park. In the nine years that we have lived in our mobile home, the rent has increased by 35%. Our income has not. The problem is you own your home, but the rent it lot it sits on, not. Unlike an apartment renter, you can't simply move out, move out if your rent increases. You're a captive tenant. The solution to the problem is a rent stabilization ordinance or enforceable model lease that will protect the homeowner from unfair rent increases while allowing local park owners a fair return on their investment. About 110 California cities and counties, including neighborhood cities and counties, already have rent stabilization ordinances in their local laws. Why not Santa Maria? The enforceable model lease 2020 final proposal, believed by the staff to be a fair compromise, contains provision not agreed upon by the homeowners. Concessions imposed on the homeowners greatly exceed those expected by the park owners. The city had a model lease program since 1999, but it's informal, voluntary, and unenforceable. Again, the model lease for 2020, while formal, is still voluntary and unenforceable. 
with the scope. With the scope of the agreement limited to within park where the owner signed the agreement, it provides no enforcement to residents in other parks where owners do not sign the agreement. Actions that we're requesting the City Council to take, including the provision of the model lease final to the discussion with the agenda items, amendment proposed for the final lease with changes requested by the homeowners, 75% of the CPI, not the 100 no floor, not 2.5%. No ceiling, not 6% 6 and a 5% increase upon the sale of the home, not Thank seven you. Susan Kappa, followed by Esther Jensen, followed by Lily Jimenez. <coughs> Good evening, Mayor Patino, council members, and the city staff. My name is Susan Kappa, and I am from the La Maria Mobile Home Park on Thornburg and San Maria. Every time a mobile home resident got up here to speak about a model lease or an RSO, a rent <coughs> stabilization ordinance, one of the things I stressed the most was it needed to be enforceable. However, the way the proposed agreement for enforcement of Model Lease 2020 reads, it is only enforceable in parts where the owner voluntarily signs the agreement. The owners of the big three parks represented by Ms. Tolk have apparently signed the enforcement agreement, and I'm happy for those parks. It sounds like they're really nice places. They've got good management, good owners, and I'm happy for them, but I'm tired of listening to them, but anyway. There is no enforcement for residents in other parks, like La Maria and the other 11 parks that we never talk about, where the owners do not sign the agreement, and there's actually no, there's no incentive for those park owners to sign. Our, we're owned by an LLC. They're never going to sign the agreement. So once again, La Maria is up the creek without a paddle, just like in 1999, when the three got their leases and everything was great, and La Maria was stuck out without, you know, the cold. Anyway, I know I don't have time. I wanted to go over some other things about whatever, but I think this is enough said. And maybe the city staff can explain to us how this is fair, maybe next, at the next meeting. Esther Jensen, followed by Lily Jimenez, followed by Cliff Solomon. Good evening, Mayor Patino, council members, city officials. My name is Esther Jensen from La Maria also and I represent the North Santa Barbara County mobile home team. I'm here again looking to the council for enforceable rent stabilization for Santa Maria. Why not Santa Maria? Cities and counties all around us have it. For the past two years, we have been meeting with city representatives and some park owners. What have we gained? Not much. What provision has the city made to take care of the elderly that no, can, can no longer pay the ever-increasing rents? We're talking serious business. Our goal is to be able to live under a roof and be self-sufficient. That's our goal. Are you willing to help us? Our wages years ago were a far cry from the $15 minimum wages of today. We've saved what we could, but it doesn't go far in today's world. Who would have thought? I don't believe it's unfair to ask for some consideration. Stop for a few moments and think ahead where you'll be 20, 25 years from now. What will the cost of living be like? Will you be able to meet your cost of living expenses other than the daily expenses? Will you stand in front of your city council and ask for fairness in your monthly rent? We on low and fixed incomes need help.
please don't let us down. Thank you. Lily Jimenez, followed by Cliff Solomon, followed by Mark <laughs> Scheibel. Good evening. Uh, I'm here again, <clears throat> excuse me, um, to speak about the harassment that I've been enduring, me and my family. There's 38 of us. Uh, I'm here alone tonight, though, um, <clears throat> to let you know that um, I have, I thank you for the chief of police that he did call me. The first time I was here, I believe he got your phone call and he called me back. So I do thank you for that. And I did let him know what was going on. Um, but he wrote me and said there was nothing he could do. I gave a letter to, you should have it's an envelope with information regarding what I'm talking about tonight. Um, uh, four months ago, I was solicited by this man. Um, this man, I went to McDonald's and he had followed me to McDonald's and I was le as I was leaving, he followed me out the door and he had asked me if I wanted to be, that he, he said that he knew who I was and he knew all the problems that I was having and he said that if I wanted to become a satelliter and I said, what's that? I never heard that before. And he kind of went into it, he went into it and he said that he, that it would be okay an answer to my health problems and to the people that were after me that I could actually hurt them if he took me under under him. So I kind of, I didn't know what to think of him, but I was a little startled and just listened to him. And it was pretty much he was inviting me to join his organized crime, um, which I just told him I wasn't interested, like to hurt others. I wasn't interested and I walked away. And I did go to the police about it and I did get, I didn't get his license paid, but I got his truck, the truck that he was driving in. Uh, like I said, they've been harassing me, my family even, to where I, where I live now. Um, but I came here and again reaching out to the public that this is really happening. And when I went home, I had Googled satellite harassment and I came across Dr. John Hall and he just kind of pretty much opened everything that I was experiencing. But anyways, thank okay. you. And thank have you, Mr. Menes. Cliff Solomon, followed by Mark Schleibel, followed by Kathy Gentry. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members, and City Staff. My name is Cliff Solomon, and I would like to briefly address the October 20th arrest and alleged use of, ex of excessive force by the Santa Maria Police. When I originally saw the video online, I was angered by what appeared to be aggressive actions taken by the police including the release of a police dog who attacked the man's leg. However, this morning I read a newspaper article about the incident and Police Chief Hansen's response. I read that he is taking, taking the situation seriously and plans on investigating the actions that were taken, even though the individual has pled guilty. I am heartened by his quote, we've worked extremely hard in the department to have the most professional part we can, to have a culture of service and treating people in the right way. It is unfortunate that it took so long for these comments to be made public. I hope that the incident is investigated thoroughly and that the findings of the investigation are clearly communicated to the public. I firmly believe that the use of body cameras would help in a situation like this, where the video found on social media only showed one part of the larger picture. I also hope that the police investigate the possible racial overtones of the incident. I urge the police to report the results of the investigation in a timely manner. I will do my best to stay informed of the results as they are reported. Thank you. Thank you. Mark Schleibel, followed by Kathy Gentry. Madam Mayor, City Council and staff, my name is Mark Schleibel, and I'm a resident of Buena Vista, Rancho Buena Vista Park, and I have signed my contract, long-term lease, and I'm very satisfied. And appreciate the owner and the managers at our park. They take care of all the needs that we have. Thank you. Kathy Gentry, followed by Glenn Newmax. <coughs> Good 
followed by Chris Johnson. Good evening. My name is Kathy Gentry. I live at Rancho Buena Vista and I have signed my lease. And I am happy with the lease. I am very happy with the managers and the owner and the owner's decisions that they have made. Thank you. Glenn Newmax. Followed by Chris Johnson. Hello, I'm a resident of Castle the Real Mobile Home Estates. I've lived there for 42 years. The owners and the management are absolutely perfect. I'm satisfied with it very well. Thank you. Thank you. Chris Johnson. Followed by Gail McNeely. Hi, I'm Chris Johnson. I dwell at uh, Casa del Rio. And I just wanted to say, I've been there for seven years. Very happy. Management's great. Uh, I've signed my lease. I just wanted the opportunity to say that. Thank you. Gail McNeely, followed by Jeannie Gladson, followed by Kathy Sharon. Good evening, Mayor and Council and staff. Uh, I have three comments today. One, I didn't mean to come to say this, but I don't understand why the city manager and the city council don't consider rent stabilization for Santa Maria. It's a logical choice and it monitors, it, it, it mirrors what's happening in Santa Barbara and San Luis Obispo. I think you have to do that to be fair to all the good people who have come all of these, the whole year, I've heard them. I don't see why you're not dealing with that head on and I wish you would. Second. I wish you would pull from the consent agenda the issue of Proposition 47 and 57. There's been no discussion. You have no public comment. You're deciding as a city council that you want to support a resolution that we have not seen. I don't think that's fair to us as citizens. I think you have to pull it today. You can add it to another agenda coming up. There's no hurry to recommend that. That's what I'd ask you to do. And finally, I did see the video which is being watched by different people. An excessive force was used, Chief. Excessive force was used on the man on the ground. I watched a man follow every direction that the police gave him on how to get out of the car, put his hands up, kneel on the ground, put, put your belly on the ground. He didn't understand that because there was an insensitivity to the language in that case. And someone was saying, say it in Spanish so he understands it. So I think what this means is we have to have citizens involved looking at these situations, not just the police investigating themselves. We need in, in, in independent investigation. We need implicit bias, de-escalation, and cultural competi competency training also. And I don't know if that's current here in our police department, but I think if it had been, they would have known what language to speak. Thank you. Jeannie Gladson, followed by Kathy Sean. Followed by Annalise Santos, I guess. Good evening, Madam Mayor, City Council members, and staff. I am C. Jeannie Gladson and reside at 519 West Taylor, 93458. When my husband and I retired to Santa Maria 19 months ago, we purchased our first mobile home in Casa Grande. We, like many senior citizens, live on a fixed income. It is our bad for not researching what life in Casa Grande Mobile Home Park would be like. We are in favor of rent stabilization within Santa Maria and the model lease presented to you and your staff, which was negotiated between Gary Hall and Mobile Home Property Owners. We believe it is a stepping off point to bringing affordable housing to our city. I have listened to pros and cons presented here at council meetings recently. Contrary to what you may have been led to believe, 
Many of us residents feel we did not have a choice but to sign the 2020 10-year lease as presented to us in July 2019 or face possible eviction. Options were not given or mentioned of a one-year and or five-year lease. It was attending these council meetings I learned of these options. Please be aware there may have been 92% of residents who signed that 10-year lease. However, I believe this percentage rate would be considerably lower now that stabilization model lease has been presented. Thank you very much, Mrs. Sharon, followed by Anna Lee Santos. Madam Mayor and members of the City Council and staff, um, I'm going to briefly comment on adopting the resolution to support the Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Act. Uh, I realize that adopting this resolution is symbolic, but I'm puzzled by the desire to make this gesture. I'm concerned about the overt racism that exists in our country today, especially as it pertains to actions by police towards people of color. I'm concerned that this initiative will move our state in a direction that will ultimately, unfairly, again, target people of color. Why go back? Our city is mostly people of color, and I'm afraid that to adopt this resolution sends the wrong message. Thank you. Thank you. Annalie Santos, followed by Sarah McDonald. Hi, my name is Anai Santos. Um, the video that went viral two weeks ago that showed police brutality was very upsetting to see. I want to voice my concern and ask for our leaders to do more to make sure it doesn't happen again. It still is not clear why even after the woman recording the video told officers to speak the, to the individual in Spanish, they did not. I'm interested to know, I'm interested in knowing how many patrolling officers speak Spanish and what about Mixteco and other indigenous language, languages that so many in our community speak. Santa Maria is home to a much more diverse population than other cities in our region. It is important that our officers are trained to work with our community. Thank you. Thank you. Sarah McDonald. Good evening, Madam Mayor and City Council members and Staff, I am Sarah McDonald. I am the director of the Observer Corps for the League of Women Voters for Santa Maria Valley, and I'm here to observe your meeting. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, everyone, for being so succinct tonight. I appreciate that. Before we move on, Mr. Stowell, did you wish to make any comments? Sure. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll um, attempt to go in order of the comments. The first comment was about the warming center, and we have been in contact uh, with Ms. Hayes, as she mentioned. The um, one issue we have is the prime time for uses of our facilities are 3 p.m. to 10 p.m. on the weekdays, which is a direct conflict with the schedule they proposed. We do continue to work um, with her to find additional community connections. We do see that the uh, Salvation Army and the church has worked well as a resource in the years past and we're working with her at, to outreach to other um, facilities in our community to provide that need. And we do recognize that it is an important need for our community. Um, the uh, police arrest video was raised. Um, we, we did review the video and did, we do see that it warranted investigation and we are conducting one. I thank the Chief uh, Hansen for his discussion on uh, the issue with the media so the public can be informed of the issue in the process moving forward. The mobile home discussion, um, there's a continued discussion about the mobile home lease and our uh, next meeting, we'll we intend to have that as an agendized item uh, for further discussion and for council action on the enforceability. And um, item 3D, with the, uh, just to maybe get a little bit of a head of, of that item. So the, well, that is on the agenda um, because it is a resolution that was written um, with the League of California Cities and the council has taken a uh, position that the 
city follows the legislative platform of the League of California Cities, and the League has uh, four strategic priorities, and the fourth one is to address public safety concerns of California cities, and this was the outcome of their efforts to uh, work with the police chiefs and the grocers with this sponsored criminal justice reform uh, measure, which will be presented to the voters in November of 2020 for anyone to be able to consider if they're an eligible voter. And that concludes my comments. Thank you. Moving on to the consent calendar, Madam Clerk, could you please read item number three? Routine items are presented for city council approval without discuss discussion as a single agenda item in order to expedite the meeting. The consent calendar is approved by roll call vote with one motion. These items are discussed only on the request of council members. Okay, does anyone have items they wish to pull for discussion? I do, Madam Mayor. Item 3D, please. 3. For further discussion and a separate vote. 3D. Yes. Okay. Okay, so does anyone ha have a motion on the rest? I, uh, uh, Madam Mayor, I'd like to go ahead and uh, make a motion to approve the consent calendar eliminating item 3D. Okay. Do I hear a second? I have a motion and a second to, pres uh, to approve the consent items with the exception of 3D. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Mokes? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Okay. Could you please read um, 3D? Uh, item 3D is a resolution supporting the Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Act of 2020. Okay. Ms. Soto? Thank, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, I'd just like to point out that I understand. Um, I, I've tried to understand the reasoning behind um, this proposed bill, but I personally cannot stand by it and cannot support it. Um, prior to Governor Bill uh, Brown, I'm sorry, taking office, um, the state of California was mandated by the courts to lower their incarceration rates. Um, we know how hurtful the three strikes rule was in California, really affecting people of color more than anybody else. And this proposed, um, this bill will cost taxpayers millions of dollars um, and investing those dollars in the private prison systems rather than investing those dollars in our educational school systems. Rather than doing so, I believe that our dollars, our taxpayer dollars, are best utilized um, in, in, in schools, in funding educational school systems and um, helping those individuals who are impacted, individuals and their families who are impacted by the criminal justice system to um, to come, to re-enter our society in a successful manner rather than continuing to, to punish. Okay, any other comments? Do you have any other comments at all? Well, this is a I was still working in law enforcement <clears throat> when the three strikes law came in. And on the surface, I think the three, the three strikes law um, did what it was designed to do except for being a deterrent. The crimes that are committed by people, I, I, don't, I don't see how they could be committed and say, well, <clears throat> Let me put it this way. Law enforcement, regardless of who they are or what color they are, have no, I, no call, no sense of, of uh, opportunity to choose the person that's the violator. The violator makes that choice. And if, if he or she is involved in a crime, how do... How do how does law enforcement get away with not investigating that crime? That, that, I mean, you can't, you can't go along the lines and say, well, we've investigated 500 in Santa Maria, so we got to stop. I mean, we get what, the law enforcement gets what they're handed. Many years ago, there was a gentleman who's long past now, his name was Aubrey Patterson, had a class and he was dealing with just names. 
and he he just went through the arrest but at that time we had a, a ledger that we wrote names down he didn't do any research with regard to whether a Miller kid was uh, half Hispanic or half black or half Oriental or anything like that he just did the names and his painstaking analysis of those names was 49 and 51 percent I don't know how closer it could be so well I well I appreciate what Ms. Soto says with regard to being able to transfer the money and use it for education and other things that would better serve our community as an investment to our community I don't know how to get away from this racial issue I, I, I it was brought up also with regard to the use of force video uh, how do you get away from that I don't know what I don't know what to do for that there's a disproportionate that uh, this is statistical certainty there's a disproportionate number of people of color people of my color that are in our in our uh, penal institutions versus Caucasians but I don't I don't know that anybody in the government made that choice those choices are made by us as offenders and I, I so it's a difficult it's difficult for me to surround except that I strongly agree that we could we should be investing money before the problems happen we need to invest money in the in in the future of our youth regardless of what color they are and and uh, it's just a difficult 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 uh, problem to surround when you're trying to establish equity in something so big but i strongly agree that if there's a way that we can funnel more money into preventative measures, not just to programs to say, don't do this. I mean, life-changing programs that will, will help misguided youth or poorly guided youth in, 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 to do things better in their future. I, I, I don't see it so much as a racial thing as I see it as as uh, getting back to a family thing and we need to and when I say family I don't mean aunts and uncles and moms and dads I mean family as in my neighbor and your neighbor and we all become that family together and, and help each other to guide our youth to a better lifestyle so it's, it's a difficult difficult thing to to wrestle with and I guess that's all I have to say mayor thank, thank you, you. Mr. Cadero. Dr. Motes. Well, thank you, Madam Mayor. And when these uh, propositions came up to be voted upon in 2014 and 2016, I voted no on both of them. And I'm pleased to say I vote no on them now. And I've, um, I've heard lots of stories of would-be shoplifters going into a store and taking out a piece of paper and a pen and going through and seeing how much they could steal before they'd hit that cap at $950. And I think it's the case that we've had a lot more shoplifting uh, now than perhaps before these propositions were proposed. You know, I think there's certain fundamental truths, one of which is thou shalt not steal. And I think these propositions justify stealing as long as it's not over $950. Thank you, Matt. Thank you. Ms. Waterfield? I find it interesting today, I went to Macy's and I parked on the second floor. And when I went to those doors that people normally go in, they were closed. They said, this, you cannot pass through these doors any longer. You have to go downstairs through the mall. So I needed to go to the second floor. So I went downstairs and went back upstairs again. And I asked one of the sales manager, I said, why are those doors closed? And she says, it's because of the theft that goes out of Macy's through those doors 
that they finally had to close them and lock them up. Didn't ask what color they were, didn't ask what racial bias, it was just stealing from whoever does that stuff. And so you'd look at the $950, it's already costing taxpayers millions of dollars with all kids coming back to us in cost of higher prices, of higher everything, it's already have cost us millions of dollars. So um, I agree with my colleagues. And, and Council Member Cadero, you're spot on. Three strikes did do its due diligence in what it was created to do. And whoever commits those crimes, those are the perpetrators. <clears throat> Doesn't matter the racial color of them, it's just, they've got to be responsible and take responsibility for their own actions. And I'm so tired of this racist stuff. My maiden name is Ramirez. My married name is Waterfield. People think I'm white and I laugh. I, and and it's, I, I find it comical only because when I tell them, no, I'm Mexican, they, t they tell me I'm a liar and I just, I let it go. You just got to let it go. There are things that you just have to let go. And so, um, this, this racial stuff is just really killing this country. And we do need to stop it. I'm just wondering when Black Friday is going to be outlawed after Thanksgiving. Because we've gotten that far down the road that it's just ridiculous anymore. So punish the people that are doing the crimes. Don't look at their skin colors, but just make sure that they are kept responsible for it. You know, um, I, I also... Um, uh, oppose the Prop 47 and 57 and it, it's you know if a person commits a crime they become a criminal and and so now we we've said okay you can steal up to $950 a day you can go into Walmart today you can go into food max tomorrow you can just go right down the right down the road and steal and we know that these people are carrying calculators with them to make sure that they get under that amount but i think what is really important is the education that we have to um, afford these people in preventing in preventing this but also when they get into prison we need a good reentry program because they are going to be coming back to our community. They have to be able to be viable citizens in our community and hopefully they will have learned. Uh, I don't want to see that recidivism and I know that Sheriff Brown, when we have the new jail out here, is going to do that. And so I am very, very hopeful with that because they are going to come back here into our community and I I really don't want to see them ostracized in our community and and they come back with skills. And so I am um, I'm going to support this. So Madam Mayor, Mr. Yes, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I just want to point out the the controversy with regard to this nine hundred and fifty dollars. This is just math, ladies and gentlemen. But somebody goes into a store and steals $950, it's going to cost you more than $950 for them to be housed in a facility in one week. Mm -hmm. Just one week. So <clears throat> in some respects, and I, and I realize I'm speaking out of both sides of my mouth here, but in some respects, you're going to pay. The taxpayer is going to pay in, in some way, shape, or form. But we're, we put somebody into a facility and perhaps spend tens of thousands of dollars for stealing a thousand dollars. Now, it used to be that I would take that kind of scenario and break it down a little bit more ridiculous when I say, well, if somebody goes into a 7-Eleven store, and at that time anyways, and steals a loaf of bread for their children, and it's a dollar fifty, and we want to put them in jail, is that right? I mean, I mean, it's a little more ridiculous by today's standards, but what is the right thing? And, and some of you people need to get step up and make some of those decisions, because you're going to pay the bill. All of us are going to pay the bill. 
I, I personally would probably rather pay the dollar twenty-seven and give the guy the loaf of bread and let him go, feed his kids or family, whatever. But I can only do that for so long. I've only got so many dollar twenty-sevens and and uh, or whatever I said. And uh, it, you still have the moral education that these people need to have to not do those things. As a young man, I worked in a small hamburger stand. And a true, true hobo came to me and said, if I sweep your parking lot, will you give me a hamburger? And I thought, yeah, then I don't have to sweep it. So where did that go? You know, and was that a sensible thing to do rather than have him reach in and just grab a hamburger and steal it? So there's a lot to be decided here for, uh, for all of us. And, and I fear that I fear that maybe we haven't done enough looking or innovative thinking in order to make the absolute perfect decision. And there may, may not be a perfect decision. But we need to stop, as uh, others have said, we need to stop the racial thing and we need to deal on the facts that we're handed with to, to deal with. Well, I think the great thing about this is that we get to decide a year from today whether we want this to go forward. So. Whether we all adopt it tonight as a city, you, every individual has the opportunity next year to vote on this at the next election. You know, and I, I forgot to mention, I was in a grocery store, and it's been about a month ago, and the checker said to me, did you see that? And I did. And here a person walked out with a, a basket load of groceries, and they didn't pay for it. And I've had other people tell me they have seen this, and it's happened to them. So I saw this with my own eyes. And, and, and they're so brazen in committing this crime. And this is, not, this is not their groceries. So anyway, OK. okay. Do you have a motion? Madam Mayor, I will make that motion uh, to adopt resolution approving an update. Wait, no, no. Adopt resolution supporting the Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Act of 2020. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve item 3D. 3D. Okay, Madam Clerk, any further discussion? Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? I have to say no based on the fact that I think there's more thinking that needs to be done. It's not because I don't agree with it, it's because I don't agree that all of the thinking has been done. Councilmember Soto? No. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. Okay, the next order of business is appointments. Madam Clerk, could you please, please read the title and give the staff report? Yes, Madam Mayor. The City Council will consider making one appointment to the Block Grants Advisory Committee. Uh, Madam Mayor, Council Members, uh, as I just mentioned, the request before you tonight is to make one appointment to the Block Grants Advisory Committee for an expired term ending in July 2022. The Board currently has one vacancy and one new application has been received from uh, Kitan Penchel. And Ms. Soto, do you have a nomination? I don't have an appointment at this, at this time, Madam Mayor. Can we please bring back the item on the next agenda with all of the applicants listed? Certainly. Thank you. It may not be the next agenda. When would it be? We'll continue to advertise. We'll continue we'll to advertise. Something. We okay. get something else in, in between now and the okay. next agenda. Okay. Thank you. So no nominations at this time. We'll keep advertising. And uh, the next item is a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider an ordinance amending various sections of the Santa Maria Municipal Code relating to tree maintenance, water service, wastewater collection, treatment and disposal, parades and assemblies, rules of conduct at the library, traffic regulations, and public safety and welfare. Thank you. Um, staff report will be given by Assistant City Attorney, Mr. Patrick. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. As you said, my name is Jeff Patrick, Assistant City Attorney, and I'm presenting tonight on what we call the technical amendments. This is something we do every year. We uh, come together with different things that can be cleaned up in our municipal code. We bring them all at once, um, get it out of the way. You may remember we did this earlier in the year. Uh, we had multiple requests and this started to kind of pile up. So this is a little bit rare, but we're doing it for the second time this year. 
Um, section one of the proposed ordinance makes changes to our urban forestry uh, chapter 88 of the municipal code and this gives us the ability to identify trees that are interfering with public improvements and it gives public works more say in what trees can be removed section two makes changes to chapter 8-10 uh, relating to water service these were requested by the utilities department for the most part they're repealing items that uh, are no longer used or enforced or that are uh, no longer necessary due to the rate changes um, there's also changes to comply with SB 998 which has to do with water shutoffs uh, section 3 is much the same it deals with chapter 8-12 for wastewater collection treatment and disposal and again mostly that's uh, repeals of no longer needed items section 4 uh, gives makes changes to section 8-4.04 C4 of chapter 84 it has to do with parades and assembly permits and it is going to make sure that parks and ray has parks and recreation has a say in uh, parade permits that go through our parks section 5 makes changes to section 8-17.03 of chapter 8-17 uh, and it relates to uh, conduct in the library this is an interesting change our <laughs> municipal code did not specifically require pants skirts or shorts in the library so we are changing it to meet the same language that is for our uh, our transit department and now those will align and you will have to wear pants or skirts or shorts uh, section six I like the inclusivity <laughs> have to cover them all people will make arguments <laughs> Let's see, section six of the ordinance makes changes to section seven dash four point four six, chapter seven uh, four. This is a very simple one, just the title of the section said San Isidro instead of San Isidro Street, so we're making that change. Uh, section seven of the ordinance makes changes to section six point one six dash one point oh two C two of chapter six point one. Uh, this has to do with camping on um, private property it's somewhat of a weird technical legal argument but we, uh, we didn't require you, you can get RV hookups at your property I'm not aware of really any uh, properties in the city that do have those but the way the ordinance was written it allowed you to camp on the property without being hooked up to those this will change it to eliminate that loophole and now you would have to be hooked up if you have them and they've already been approved I have a question in regards to that. Say somebody from out of state comes to visit you and they have an RV mm -hmm. and they hook up to your house because that's they want to be right there for a couple of days, a few days. Is that lawful or is that going to be unlawful? If the house has approved recreational disposal facilities that have already been installed and approved, I believe, by either Public Works or a building inspector, I don't think that any, I'm not aware of any house that has one. I asked yeah. around, no one knew of any. Mm -hmm. But if they had them, if they complied with all our rules and gotten them, then yes, it would be legal. Okay. Uh, Mr. Pappy, can I ask a question? Yes. In uh, regards to the uh, vehicle sanitary connection. Now, is that electricity and water, or is that a place for the black water in the vehicle to dispose of waste material? I believe it would just be for waste material. Just waste material. Mm. And can I ask another question? Of course. Um, if you're a homeless person and you've decided to live in your car or your RV in the city of Santa Maria, where can you park your car or RV? That is a more complicated question than I've prepared. <laughs> yeah, but after this, you will not be able to park it and camp on somebody's property. But in public streets, you could? I'm not sure of that answer. I can get back to you. It, no. It's included in the ordinance C1. Did you can or can't? You can't. It's unlawful. It's unlawful. Mm -hmm. Because I see people parked in RVs all the time. They live in their RVs. Mm -hmm. And, uh, well, I see people running red lights all the time, but uh, that doesn't make it legal. <laughs> I know, but it's easier to catch a parked <laughs> RV than someone speeding after a red light infraction. Are we at the question part? I don't know. 
That, that okay. includes my report. That concludes. Okay. 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 Just to point this information. Okay. That's all. Ms. Soda, you had a question? Yes. Um, I, I have a couple, actually. Um, can we start with the tree section of the ordinance? Um, how, how many arborists do we have on staff? Uh, Mr. Rosado, can you help? Uh, we have two arborists on staff. Two? And in the ordinance, um, it, as it, ta it talks about remo the removal and planting, removing existing trees and planting new, new trees, my question is, um, how, what's the criteria, what, what's the, do, is there like a set set of rules that are used to determine whether a tree should be removed or um, a criteria for when is the best time of the year, season cycle to plant new trees? I'm not sure if we have it for seasons or time as far as removing trees, but we would have different rules for when a tree can be removed. Currently, they're fairly restrictive, and what we found in the purpose for making these changes is that they were destroying city infrastructure. So they would pull up sidewalks, pull up streets, and unless the tree specifically was sick or diseased, then we were very limited in being able to remove it and replace it. So the purpose of this is to give specifically Public Works uh, the option of looking at trees and removing ones that are just problematic, invasive, creating problems or that are likely to create problems. So the decision making of whether a tree should be removed will be made by the Director of Parks, of Recreation and Parks and the Public Works Director or one or the other? Either or depending on certain factors. Either or, okay. Okay, and then um, going on to section seven, um, which is unlawful camping. With, these, with this ordinance, ordinance essentially make it illegal to be homeless in the city of Santa Maria? If I may respond to that, yeah. absolutely not. Homelessness is it's not, is illegal. not uh, illegal. conduct. Conduct is the issue that is addressed through the municipal code. And in this case, conduct that is being issued, which is actually not being changed in its current, current status of law, is that it is unlawful to camp as, as defined. And we are, both my department and the city police department are absolutely following both state, federal, and court identified rules with respect to that. So in no way is homelessness as a status criminal. Conduct may be. Conduct like sleeping on a public street, sidewalk, parking lot, shelter, under a bridge? As made determined by this council through the municipal code, what this council has made determinations of what is lawful conduct, we absolutely enforce. That has not changed with this amendment. Would this um, ordinance make it illegal for people to li live in their vehicles if they are parked in a public street? <coughs> Again, the illegality that is addressed with this is the disposal of sewage, which is conduct that we have identified as problematic for the health and safety of the residents and citizens who live here because there have been incidents where RVs will simply drain their waste stream into gutters, into stormwater areas, and then cause potential um, impacts to the environment and to the other residents. That's what's trying to be addressed here. Thank you. And I, I, I have had complaints, and I've had people call me, and I have seen it where they have just disposed of human waste by their RVs. So that is the clarification yeah. we're yeah. trying to make. No, no. How many RV parks do we have in the city of Santa Maria? With respect to RV parks for uh, mobile RVs as opposed to mobile homes, I believe the the answer is three. Three. Yes, ma'am. In Santa. Maria. I believe so. Yes. Again, we'll, we'll be addressing that at, at our next meeting with respect to mobile homes. And Councilwoman Soto, I would point out that this section is already a part of our municipal code. I see that. Uh, the only amendment is that if you're parking a car on your property in compliance with the code, you now have to be hooked up to approved uh, RV facilities. Mr. Patrick, if, if someone, a homeless person lives in his car, but parks it in Orchid. Is that okay? 
I mean, does, does Orchid have yes. uh, yes. girls yes. that uh, you know, I mean, I've never heard of a car that, you know, has a, a mechanism to dispose of waste into a preset system. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. It's not particularly the car, but it's the way that the ordinance was written in the past. Mm -hmm. If you had a car and recreational facilities, you were allowed to park the car or any vehicle on the property just by nature of having the recreational vehicle facilities on the property, even if they weren't hooked up. So yes, you most likely could not hook up a car to them, but you also did not have to hook up an RV if you were parked in the driveway. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So Ms. Soto? I just want clarification, and I'm sorry if I'm sounding like a broken record. Um, so if I were sleeping in the public, on public street, would I get cited based on how this ordinance is written? In order to answer that, again, one of the reasons that the ordinance is written in, in a broad format is to allow officer discretion to make a determination at the scene with respect to the rest of the indicia. Camping implies a more than sleeping, more likely a living a lifestyle element. And again, we try to provide a broad framework to give the maximum amount of officer discretion so that individual context can be taken into account. So that's the reason it's drafted the way it is. Thank you for the clarification. Any other questions? Okay. You know, I, I know a lot of people are going to be real happy with the trees thing because there's so many people would like to get trees. And I've, I've had probably four or five times a year I get people calling because they no longer want that tree that has grown too big in their front yard. And it makes a mess. And especially when they're elderly and they want it taken out. And I have to tell them, I'm sorry, unless it's diseased or really causing a problem, it's not going to be. So this is going to make a lot of people happy. Thank you. And it certainly is going to make our code compliance people happy too, because <laughs> they're the ones that are having to take the brunt of this. Madam Mayor. Yes, Mr. I, I Cordero. I think this very issue may address the gentleman that you and I spoke with uh, up on the northeast side of town regarding the tree that was next to the sewer line. Yes. Uh, I, I, I mentioned that to uh, Mr. Stilwell, and I, I don't have his contact information, but it, it may be something that if he's watching, he can recontact <laughs> us again and see if we can help him with this since the tree is a city we'll, tree. We'll make sure the Santa Maria property. Times puts that in bold print. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. If there's no other. Okay, uh, I'll bring it back to the council. Is there public comment? Oh, I sh yeah, I guess I should have. Yes, I have to have public comment. Thank you. <laughs> public comment. We have one request to speak on this item. Okay. Kathy Sharon. falling off so um, I'm a huge fan of trees huge fan of plants in general and um, I I disagree with the ability of having the director of public works not working with the other person the other director of recreation and parks I, uh, I don't know, I think trees have a huge value in, in our cities, in our lives, and even if we don't really pay much attention to them, um, we don't like it when they're messy. Um, they provide habitat, they get rid of CO2, they provide shade, they're beautiful, they do lots of things and have lots of benefits, and I don't think that people who aren't experienced or don't have the correct um, background should be just going out and trimming things willy-nilly because somebody has a complaint. So I would rather see the, the, the director of public works working in concert with the other, you know, the, uh, the arborist. And, and, and they do work with the arborists. And I, I hated to say, like, we just, we, I think we plant like 800 trees a year in the city. 
So I, I agree with well, you. That's so good. we're, that's we're good. planting a lot of trees, okay. but every now and then there's that one tree that really causes a problem, and so yeah, yeah, I understand. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> but um, the way the code is written, it doesn't really say that there has to be, they, they have to work together. It's, it kind of sounds like now they can work independently. So the um, director of public works or um, someone in that person's stead could make that decision. And I, I'm just concerned about that, that we're not relying on biologists or consultants that um, can really... Uh, determine whether things should be cut down or trimmed or um, are really diseased and and I, I just have one more plug that I need to put in uh, for native plants um, I didn't see anything in the municipal code about that but I would hope that at this day and age we would be encouraging uh, planting native trees and plants um, first as a first choice if they don't work they don't work but um, they're drought tolerant, they resist disease, they're, they're just a good fit because they're Californian. So um, that's my two cents worth. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Um, any written communications? No, Madam Mayor. Okay. So we'll bring it back for a discussion and action. If there's no further discussion, Madam Mayor, I'd like oh, to... Oh, wait, Mr. Cordero? Oh. Yes, yes, Madam Mayor, thank you very much. <clears throat> I took this... Uh, to mean that when a, when a, a tree or, or, or any kind of vegetation is, is, has become destructive, that that's not going to take an arborist or that's not going to take any scientist or any, anybody with any special training regarding the services that the tree provides and that person can make the decision to, to mitigate that damage that's being done. The, the case that I'm talking about that I mentioned to the mayor a while ago was a tree in someone's front yard that was a city tree that was, had destroyed the, the sewer line lines. and it was working its way up into the house and eventually with, uh, with the, the knowledge they had will eventually enter under the, under the um, slab flooring and raise the slab flooring so this tree is being destructive. I, I don't think that's going to create the need to have a, a six-year trained arborist to come and say that that tree's naughty, let's get rid of it. Uh, I don't think there's an effort to cut more trees down. I think it's an effort to recognize that some trees have the ability to cause damage and we want to minimize that to the citizens that are directly affected by that tree. Uh, I think we're a long ways from just cutting, we're never going to be there in Santa Maria as far as I can tell, where we're going to say, well, let's just cut them all down. That's not going to happen here. Uh, that love for trees and things has been going on for way too many years. And so, I, I know we also have lists of trees that, that that Mr. Mr. Teniente, who takes care of the trees, knows his business, he's very prudent. Um, he will not cut a tree down unless it absolutely has to be cut down. Trust me when I say that, because <laughs> I've had many conversations with him. <laughs> and, and so if he has to get someone in here to check and see if it's infested, infested with something, he will do that. But he, he is very knowledgeable and he's very prudent. And he so knows every he tree knows in town. Everything. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, I thank Council Member Cordero and Madam Mayor for that clarification because I think um, on my end, that's, that's something that I'm also concerned about. I want to make sure that whenever we're removing any type of tree, city tree, that we're doing it in a way that's thoughtful, conscious, and responsible. Um, we owe it to the residents of, of Santa Maria. And so um, part of that would be making sure that we're taking appropriate steps and determining um, when the removal of a tree is important. Not because in the ordinance, it doesn't just talk about um, when it's obstructing private property, when it becomes a danger, but then also the remo it's, it talks about removing dead, disease or has, uh, dead or diseased trees. And so I think that in that part of the ordinance, um, 
or just in this ordinance. It's really important, and I would like to see um, Public Works Director working alongside our Recreation and Parks Department. Um, and the way that the ordinance is written, it, it doesn't state that. For instance, on page 2, section 8-8.02, it says, Director means the City Director of Recreation and Parks. Oh, not that part, sorry. Um, where is it? Somewhere in here. Just one second. Where is more? And uh, while you're looking for that, I know that when we do remove trees, we, tr we um, quite often just plant another tree in there that is, that that is on, that the that's on the list of, of recommended trees to plant. And, and when there's new developments, we do the same thing. They have a, a list of, of trees. We negotiate with them, and um, we usually make them plant more trees than they want. That's usually the big fight. And, and the parks and, and seen that. work with the public. And, and know, they work all together to do this. So and the planning commission. Am, so am I right, eight, how, about 800 trees a year we plant? Isn't that? Yes, it varies from year to year. But yeah. yeah. So we're, we're planting a lot of trees. Yeah, yeah and the yeah. question is, I mean, I'm glad that we're planting trees. I think the question here is, um, you know, just making sure that we have our public works director working alongside our recreation and parks department. Um, I found the section that I was referring to on page three, section 8-803. It states the director of recreation and parks or his, um, the, uh, their, his, it should be there. Authorized representative, representative, or the director of public works. Um, it says and or, but I would much rather see it just be and, so that they're working alongside together rather than it just being left to one or the other. You know what? We've done it this way, yeah. and I don't mean to sound like we've done it this way so long. It is so workable, and I don't want to see this obstructed unnecessarily. It's very workable the way it is. And, and, I, and I understand what you're saying. It's just, and I'm glad that that's what we're doing right now. Right now, our Department of Public Works and our Recreation and Parks Department are working together. But I would like to see that reflected in the ordinance in the way that it's written. Um, because it's, it's important that we have those who are experts in the trees to also be able to be a part of this decision making. I'm just concerned that in the event that our director of, of Rec and Parks is not available, that the decision will be solely left to the director of Public Works. Um, so that's one part of the ordinance that I would like for us to discuss. But then also, um, you know, it makes a lot of references to the director of Parks or his authorized representative. We can't assume that we'll always have a male director. Well, the, the man works under the director. That's why he, he the man works under the director of Mr. Posada. And no, that's why. what I so mean is, it's his. It's, it it's says his. It, it could be no. slash her. Her, or no, it could be her. there, you know, to be gender. <laughs> or it could be it, you know, the way you want to be politically correct. <laughs> but, no, no. It, is that it, what you want to do? It, I mean, this it, is just excuse crazy. Me, excuse me one minute, uh, Mr. Watson. <laughs> Madam Mayor. Um, as, as referenced many of our codes, uh, which I identified as soon as I got here, um, they are somewhat archaic, and there are ways of us changing pronouns throughout the code as part of another technical amendment where we would say um, in the definition section, his can also be hers or theirs. Uh, we'll, we'll add that to our next technical amendments. Thank you. Um, okay. Additionally, uh, for the purposes of statutory construction, it is usually better to have an and or so that it isn't then required to be both because there are occasions where that is not necessarily available so that's why we ordinarily use an and or although it has been my short time experience but many of the uh, particularly alex's experience um, that this is a closely knit small town team and so there, there typically is consultation both between public works the arborist uh, and, and without direction from council, because again, that's an operational element, yeah, right. and for statutory construction, we try to keep it broad and then use discretion in the field. Right, and, I, and my point is, I don't understand why that can't be iterated in the way the ordinance is written. Uh, Madam Mayor, if I may, and talk about okay. my past experience. This is my second term with city council, but my previous was 11 years as a planning commissioner. 
and we all had parks and recs and we had public service any time a development came or any time there was a situation it worked great and I've got to reiterate it is a close-knit uh, family when it comes to the city employees I don't I, I would feel more comfortable with and or on it and not and on it because it has worked very very well okay I, I think I think you're right we're talking about <coughs> ordinance and 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 I think maybe Minnesota you're talking about <coughs> procedure and so there is procedure that's procedures and processes that are worked out through parks and rec and with in regards to trees anyway do I hear a motion oh I, another oh. section I'd like to point out oh, okay <laughs> thank you um, I'm still I'm concerned about section 7 I um, you know we have over 400 houseless individuals in the city of Santa Maria and my concern is that having an ordinance having this section in the ordinance in place um, will make it challenging for for even more challenging for folks. I'm worried that they're going to get cited for sleeping on public streets, parking lots, whatnot. Um, I'm also concerned about, um, you know, folks getting cited for living in their vehicles. Um, you know, the winter time, winter season is upon us. Cold, you know, weather. The temperature is going to drop, and um, rather than putting forward ordinances or policies that will make it challenging for individuals to survive during these times of the year, initiating or having conversations about, like for instance, safe parking programs like the city of Santa Barbara has implemented. Um, I'm just really concerned that what we are doing here is making it more challenging for folks to survive in our city. Citing them is is not, and I don't know, I mean, I'm assuming, right, and please correct me if I'm wrong, that if I violate the way an ordinance is written, I can get cited, right? So essentially we're saying here that if people are, are homeless, they can get cited. And why I say that is because most people who are homeless live on the street. They live under a bridge. Um, and I just really worry that we're making the problem worse rather than solving it. Well, I, okay, and I'm coming up from a, a health and safety, and I've seen where they have dumped a human waste into the streets and then it goes into our waterways. That to me is, is really a big issue. When we start, because we are going to be getting involved with the homeless and trying to solve that problem here in Santa Barbara County, then I think that it warrants a discussion in that. But I, I think it's really important that the health and safety of, of our community is, is, is very important. It's just extremely important to me. I, a, I just had a question. Sure. Um, you're a student at Allen Hancock College, and you have no money, but you have a car. And now with this free tuition, you can go to school, but you could live in your car and park it at the Allen Hancock parking lot, and you could use the gym to take care of your cleanliness and sanitary aspects. Mm -hmm. So would this then make it illegal to uh, live in your car in the parking lot no, at Allen Hancock College? No, no, no. Because go ahead, Mr. Watson. With respect to that um, item two A, uh, it, it is not unlawful to camp on private property with written permission of the owner. So the answer would be that would be a lawful basis with permission of Allen Hancock. Now, if, Han if Allen Hancock did not provide you permission then you potentially could run afoul of this ordinance. Thank you. But the, the important part of that is, again, we're not criminalizing conduct yeah. uh, it, in the sense of being homeless. We are criminalizing items such as dumping human waste into gutters. That's really the purpose. Okay, do I hear a motion, a discussion? So, sorry, I have a question. So if I, do not, if I don't agree with how the ordinance is written and if we're not willing to make, to negotiate it, then vote I, don't, no. I don't vote on it, right? You can vote no. I, I'm looking at them, yeah. right? Okay. Okay, thank you. Um, one other thing, just to, 
you know, be that council member. On page two, it says reduce city liability and increase public safety. Can we switch that? Increase public safety and reduce city liability. Yes, on the bullet point. Uh, which one is that? Second one from your body. Two, page two. Just switch the verbiage, so or the or the the way that the sentence sentence is written. So, increase public safety and reduce city liability. I, if if that's an amendment that you choose to add, we could make that change. Um, I don't know that it changes the structure of the sentence, but. If that's the pleasure of council, we're happy to do that for the second reading if that's an amendment that council agrees to. What, what does that do to your interpretation of the writing that it is today? What it is that? Puts the, for me, it puts public I'm, I'm safety. Asking this, and, I'm asking the oh. city attorney, what does that do? For it, his it, it has no lawful change. Oh, okay. It's because it's a, in essence a finding. What is the pleasure here? Well, if it has no lawful change, I'm not opposed to making the uh, change uh, if it if it satisfies that 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 part that she's concerned about. I have no problem with it. That's three. But, you, Whatever. but again, just working together, rec and public works, having that be written in here. But, I mean, I'm just curious. You all haven't said anything as to what your thoughts are. You on mean that. the both rather than, than either or? Rather than saying one or, having it, it having having it be <clears throat> together, like working, well, working in conjunction, or the and, or just you know. I think Mr. Watson explained very well that it makes it easier to get something done rather than if someone's not there and they're out of the area, then it makes it easier to get it done. I just want to make sure that we're consulting I, I, with You know what, everybody. Gloria, it has worked so well and we've not had a problem and I don't want to um, hamper what's been done uh, and that can get done very easily the way it is right now. Madam Mayor, so, if I may, I think I spoke to that a little bit when I said that it's not always going to be necessary for the arborist and the scientist to be together. Right. Uh, somebody else can be there, and if the person is not here and won't be back for two weeks, that could delay a decision for two weeks or more. So, so there are times when dealing specifically with a tree or, or and and it's. Uh, surroundings that you don't need that scientist to become involved if the tree is damaging the infrastructure it's damaging the infrastructure there's no need for there's no need for a second opinion uh, am I correct in that no you're correct but I also wanted to, to clarify because I'm, I'm not sure that um, Councilmember Soto understands the section the section is that, bo that both of those individuals have authority to enforce the action which is why also why it's and or, because this section deals with enforcement and appeals. So, um, for, particularly for that section, you would not want to have an and because that would require both Public Works and Rec and Park to agree to enforce this code against a private property owner, and that's really not the function. The function is separate. One is for safety of infrastructure and one is for dead, diseased, and damaged trees. So they really have different functions. And with respect to the context of the section which you're asking to potentially have amended, I don't think you would want to do that in that context because it's not a joint decision on whether or not to take the tree out. It's a joint decision on whether or not to enforce this code against a private property owner. So you wouldn't want to have them have to work in conjunction on that. With respect to the items, they each have different responsibilities. Public Works has responsibilities for infrastructure, pavement, sidewalks. The Parks Department has issues related to dead, diseased trees where their arborist goes out and does review. So I just want to make sure you understood the context of what you were asking to change. You know, I, I would suggest that you get together, with Mr. Teniente, and have a ha and spend some time with him, and you will feel very, you will have a level of comfort after you've spoken to him. I guarantee you that. I just worry about what happens if he's gone. <laughs> 
you know. Okay. That happens. Yeah. yeah he does take vacations. Mm -hmm. Madam Mayor, if there's no other discussion, okay. I'd like to make a recommendation to a motion. A motion okay. to uh, introduce uh, for the first reading an ordinance amending the various sections of the Santa Maria Municipal Code relating to tree maintenance, water service, wastewater collection, treatment and disposal, parades and assemblies, rule of conduct at the library, traffic regulations, and public safety and welfare. Uh, I'll second that. Okay, there's a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Yes, Madam Mayor. Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Soto? No. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. So the next order of business is a regular business item. Madam Kirk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider updates to the Santa Maria Municipal Code relating to building and fire codes in alignment with recently adopted State of California building codes that will take effect January 1, 2020. Thank you. And the staff report is to be given by Director of Community Development, Mr. Aang. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the City Council. Uh, some background information. State of California Building Standards Commission adopts new state standards every three years, which cities and counties are then mandated to implement. The 2019 California Building Codes are codified in the Santa Maria Municipal Code and adopted by reference to allow local deviations from the state code and enables the city to enforce the building code through local methods and processes. There are a number of different codes that uh, that will be that's included in this recommendation. It's a lot of work that the Building Standards Commission puts into, and I've included a list of the different codes, including the building code, energy code, mechanical, residential, electrical, plumbing, and so forth. Also included are the 2019 Fire Code and the International Property Maintenance Code. Because some of the upcoming changes are related to energy, I wanted to provide some background on how the Energy Commission was established. It was established in 1974 by the Warren Alquist Act to respond to the energy crisis of the early 70s and the state's growing demand for energy resources. The California Legislature continues to amend this act by addressing to address pressing energy needs and issues through Title 24. So some of the key changes in the 2019 code, starting January 2020, uh, res new residential homes are required to have solar photovoltaic systems. Also, uh, in the 2019 energy code, uh, there's a new HERS system rating, which stands for Home Energy Rating System. Essentially, the state is asking for higher efficiency from uh, windows, attics, and walls for new construction. In addition, uh, in the 2019 building code, as part of uh, new developments uh, for commercial and, and offices, uh, there's a requirement for electric vehicle infrastructure. So these are the notable changes in the upcoming uh, 2019 codes. In addition, uh, there are some uh, local changes. Uh, there is uh, are that the city is requesting the uh, adoption of the International Property Maintenance Code, which will give co-compliance an additional tool uh, in addressing uh, violations. Uh, in addition, for uh, fire prevention, there's adjustments to the fire sprinkler thresholds, and also in regards to firework permits. And this language was uh, inadvertently uh, left out of the draft that was in the agenda item, but the language is included here. Uh, the language proposes to go uh, to a lottery system for permits issued for firework sales. And I'll, I'll just read the proposed change. Uh, if the number of ap applications exceeds the number of authorized permits, a lottery system developed and administered by the Recreation Parks Department shall be implemented to determine which qualified applicants receive permits. The lottery shall be conducted each year that the number of applicants 
exceeds the number of authorized booths. So we are also requesting that this language be included in the overall recommendation. Staff's recommendation is that the council introduce an ordinance for first reading and continue to the next meeting for second reading and adoption amending chapter 9-1 through 9-19 of Title IX of the Santa Maria Municipal Code concerning building and fire regulations and international property maintenance regulations and also including the language regarding uh, the uh, safe and sane fireworks permitting. There, this was a collaborative effort between various departments and we have representatives from community development, from the code enforcement, and from fire here to answer questions. Yes, Mr. Ng, in regards to the fireworks, is there going to be a certain amount of permits handed out? I think so. Councilman Lerba, I will defer that question over to uh, uh, Chief Campbell. Okay. Or <laughs> that part of the um, municipal code is not proposed to change. We still have the same formula for based on population, and okay. I think we have 25. Is it yeah, so based on the formula in the municipal code, it's 25, and we don't propose a change at this time. And so um, is the submission date, is that a change for the nonprofits to June 5th? Yes. Okay, so they're really going to need to be advised of this. Is there any yeah. kind of, of a leisure way if they miss the... June 5th drop date. Yeah, this is this is underway, and I think uh, Chief Champion can give a little update on where we are on this process. We have worked, we have done community outreach. We are working with them, and there is a process underway. Right, right, I, and I, I'm going to attend that meeting that we're going to be having yes. here this week. And but I just want to make sure uh, before we vote on something like this that. <laughs> I, it's amazing because as uh, being a board member for the Santa Barbara County Fair and when uh, the 4-H kids always submitted their applications and everything, there were some kids that didn't make that quota. And so there was kind of a little bit of a, a leeway for saying, okay, get, get your permits and get everything in in regards to that. So this is what I'm asking. Are we going to have that for our nonprofits for the... Yeah. Yes, and just by way of introduction, this is language and direction we received from the council when we presented the fireworks uh, update in July, after the last 4th of July, when we talked about the change to the safe and safe fireworks and no. so we're bringing this back to uh, implement it in the code which is why it's here tonight but as far as the process of how we're doing the work I defer to chief champion to present where we are on that okay and so that that's my question to you okay thank you council member Waterfield mayor and city council this has been a uh, something that we have been working on for a number of years at least the past three fire chiefs that I can remember have been working on this along with uh, Rec and Parks and so we are in process of developing that lottery system. Currently, it's, it's modeled after a first priority so that if you're in, you're in, and the only way that you can possibly get into that list of 25 is that somebody vacates. So we have people on a waiting list that sit there for a number of years. We're trying to fix that by creating an equitable means for uh, the nonprofits to all participate in, in this activity. So as far as notification, we've already notified all the nonprofits that this is going to occur. This has been discussed for many years. They all are familiar with that. Uh, we are also going to have a town hall meeting uh, this week right. to discuss that. All are invited to, and we'll make sure that all the nonprofits are fully aware of a deadline or any time that they have to apply. And that deadline, if, if somebody does not get the word, um, are we going to give any kind of, of or legency in regards to file it June 6th or June 7th? We're going to do everything between okay. now and then okay. to make sure that everybody's been notified, reached out to, contacted. We have a list of all the nonprofits, the ones that are, are part of the 25, those that are on a waiting list, and so they will uh, be aware of the change. So you're telling me June 5th is a drop date? <laughs> yes. So without saying it, okay, yes. that's all I want to know. <laughs> okay. What, what, when is the meeting, Chief? Thursday night. Thursday, Thursday. yep. Let me ask you something, Chief Champion. Um, are there, 
nonprofits from out of Santa Maria that sell fireworks in Santa Maria? Yes, ma'am. And they're allowed to? So we're looking at uh, doing some additional adjustments to the process. So what that means is that we're looking at nonprofits within the city of Santa Maria, the city limits only, and we're limiting one nonprofit per organization. Oh, so like Santa Maria High has a soccer team, a baseball team, a football team, but you're just going to allow one? So they can choose which one they want to fund. If, they, if we are over our 25 and we are in a lottery system, if Santa Maria High is fortunate to get one of those, then they get to choose which booster club that they want uh, to fund. Same with Rotary? <laughs> that's that's right. Rotary, yeah. And so again, we're Come trying on, to yeah. make it um, as across the board fair as we possibly can, instead of certain groups kind of have a lock hold on, on something for years, and nobody else really gets to get in. Well, what about churches? Same I mean, thing. Same thing. One church out of the whole community, or? No, okay. no ma'am, sorry. So if there are a, a youth group, a worship group, okay. Okay. still okay. one per Just one, okay, nonprofit. got it. Where is it at? Where? The, uh, the <laughs> meeting is going to be, I believe, at the Manami Center. Yeah. Six, six o'clock, six o'clock Thursday night. Thank Any you. other questions? I do, oh, Madam Mayor. Um, Chief Champion, how did um, the local adjustment um, for the fire sprinklers, how did you all determine the 5,000 square feet? Is it 5,000? Sure. This is one of four uh, adjustments that we are doing to um, the, the fire code, the municipal code. That one is we're continuing, about, continuing to evaluate uh, when sprinklers should be implemented. And so there's two assemblies, um, two occupancies, excuse me, and that is the business uh, occupancies and the um, manufacturer, or sorry, mercantile. So if you have a small business under 5,000 square feet, then you do not, you're not required to have a sprinkler system put, put in. Right now, the municipal code states 7,500 square feet. We're reducing that down to 5,000 square feet. As far as businesses, there is no limit. Uh, the only trigger would be if uh, you have a certain occupancy that triggers a sprinkler ordinance. So you could have a 20,000 square foot business as long as you don't have a life threat that triggers sprinklers, there would be no sprinklers in that business. So we're trying to put some parameters on that. We're trying to bring it into in line with many of our other groups, which is around 5,000 square feet. So this would only be for businesses and what was the other one? Mercantile? Mercantile. Does this, is, is our residents how, homes? No, ma'am. No. Not yet. Not yet. <laughs> R1 and R2, yes. Okay. Right, that's that's, that's, okay. Any other questions? Ms. Soto, any other questions? Okay. Um, uh, yes, I do. Um, regarding the IPMC, the International Property, um, the International Property Maintenance Code, um, what are the advantages of us implementing and adding that to our ordinance? <coughs> I'm not familiar with that code, so I will have to defer. I was, I was going to bring up uh, <coughs> the code enforcement supervisor, but I can tell you part of the reason that we've, we've requested that this be added is it does what we call provide more tools in the toolbox. Mm -hmm. It has some, some s substantial elements that uh, Ms. Justin has seen in her career, so I'll defer to her. Um, Council Member Soto, Madam Mayor, uh, Council Members, if the IMPC or IPMC does provide us some additional tools that we don't currently have. Um, so it will increase some protections for the residents that we currently have, um, for the interior, the exterior, and for the community itself. Some of them are kind of little things. Um, we get a lot of complaints in reference to uh, overgrown weeds in neighborhoods and this kind of thing. A lot of times with where our code is currently written is it just says in public view. So if you have a residence where it's actually in the exterior and it's creating a lot of rodents and a lot of problems, 
there's not a whole lot we can do. Or if it's a vacant property and there's exterior, all we can really do is try to clean up the front. Um, unless we, you know, work with the property owner and, and find out what's going on. With, the, with this code, it's actually going to give us the authority to say that you just need to clean up the exterior of a property. Uh, so we have a, a little bit better tools there. Uh, some of the public health stuff is um, almost commonplace for what we would think is normal, but it, it's written in the code, so again, it gives us a little bit more authority. Oftentimes we also find like refrigerators or appliances that are left on the side of the road. Maybe they're going to, even in an easement area, and they're going to get picked up by somebody or they've called it in and it's going to be the next day. This code actually will say you have to take the doors off to make sure that nobody's mm -hmm. going to be trapped inside, that kind of thing. With right now, we don't really have that as anything other than a suggestion if we come across it before it's picked up. Thank you. Ms. Ms. Waterfield? Yes. I have a question for Mr. Ng. Um, in regards to the new housing where the, you have to do the solar system, the solar panels in 2020, is that going to be required for ADU starting in 2020 as well? It's a brand new uh, apartment. Councilman Blanca, I'm going to have our acting building division manager, Alex Rodriguez, uh, come and provide information. Okay, thank you. Uh, the answer is I don't know if I know the answer to that yet. <laughs> because the ADU, we know that there are brand new things coming starting January 1st and that are still to be kind of worked out. But uh, currently, uh, according to the California Energy Commission's website, this is for new homes. And whereas an accessory dwelling unit is accessory to an existing dwelling, so far, any requirements such as fire sprinklers, uh, if it wasn't required on the primary dwelling, then it wouldn't be required on the ADU. So my guess is that if you have a brand new home and a brand new ADU, both of those, those may require fire. photovoltaic okay. systems, whereas if you have an existing home and they're going to add an ADU, probably not. Okay, thank you. Will you let me know if that changes? Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes, Dr. Motes. No, I'd like to ask a little bit about the solar panels, too. What's going to be the additional cost per housing unit to put solar panels on? Now in the times when everybody's complaining about the unaffordability of housing, we're going to add how much on to each house? Again, it, the California Energy Commission website says that on average uh, you look at about a $9,500 additional cost for the construction of a home to implement all of the new 2019 energy code requirements. So that's not just photovoltaic, there are some other uh, things as well. Uh, but on the other hand, the, the percentage of, of energy being used by the home is going to be reduced by as much as 53% with the, with the photovoltaic system. So uh, it, it is an added expense, but there will be savings uh, along with it. You know, it's interesting because Mr. Uh, Joe Halsell told me uh, anywhere from twelve to $15,000 we could be looking at, of course, depending on the size of the house. Too. Well, so. they're not going to be required to install any, any bigger of a system that it takes to run the, the home. In fact, they, they want to avoid having an excess of energy being produced because they don't get reimbursed for that. So some, most of these systems for an average, say, 1,500 to 2,000 square foot house are going to be pretty small, pro probably you know, easily you know, affordable, I, I think. You know, I, I was just thinking it, it, the state keeps making mandates for us to have to pass along to the builders and developers. When is the state going to say you can no longer have natural gas run to your house and that all the cooking has to be done on an electric range? Very soon. <laughs> I believe that's already happening. It is. Uh, and some cities, I want to say, Berkeley and maybe even the city of San Luis Obispo mm -hmm. have already uh, started making changes toward that if they haven't already made the change. Yeah. 
But we all know that gourmet chefs will only want to cook <laughs> with gas. What will we do to the art form of culinary if we have to cook on an electric range? Something's got to go. <laughs> you may have to take up a new endeavor there, Dr. Motes. It's true. <laughs> Mr. Cordero? I don't want to say anything else. <laughs> Okay, do we have any written communications? Oh, I still had questions. Okay. We we did have written, written communications or not? No, ma'am. No, Mayor, okay, I'm sorry, I didn't hear it. Okay, Ms. Soto. Thank you. Um, going back to the International Property Maintenance Code, um, I saw that on Chapter 4 of that code, there's reference to occupancy limitations. Um, for instance, on Table 404.5 of the International Property Maintenance Code, um, which is not on our agenda. Um, it talks about, and maybe you can help me understand what I'm reading. It has like space, like living room, dining room, bedrooms, minimum area in a square feet, and it lists the number of occupants based on, I'm assuming, the square footage. Correct. Can you, can, can you help me understand that, please? Absolutely. Um, the, under the IPMC, what they are estimating, or what their code says, is that you need to have, in every home, 120 square feet. This also does not apply to efficiency units. Efficiency units have um, a different um, number. This would be a standard um, R1 or residential home. Um, you should have 120 square feet of living space, 70 square foot per bedroom, which is basically the size of a twin bed and a dresser, um, and that would be sufficient for one person. And then every f 50 square feet after that, you could have an additional person. Um, Sometimes it is kind of hard to make how, how that breakdown is. What it basically is is if you have one person, you need the 70 square feet, but if you have two people in that space, you only need 100 square feet. Um, this is also in line with what the uh, California code is for uh, farm worker housing, for agriculture, for all that. It's basically the exact same standard from a bedroom space size. So if, if, if there's, um, so I guess my, I'm just going to cut to the chase. Does this have the potential to cite property owners in the event that there's more people living in a complex than what the states? Um, if you end up with a residential home where you have 20 or 30 people in it, then it would be something that we may act on. Um, if it's an unsafe situation, you would have, it's, it's not about families or anything like that. Right now we have the boarding house ordinance. So you could have a three bedroom house and you can rent up to two rooms. So there's no square footage in either of those locations. So you could take a bedroom and put as many people into that room as you wanted. Whereas with this, it's kind of saying that there should be um, an appropriate amount of living space because from a psychological standpoint, from a health and safety standpoint, from a disease standpoint, you want to have every human being needs a little bit of something. So um, this would, this doesn't limit that you could put people in a living room. It just means that you have to have a living space that also has 120 square feet. So if you have another 70 square feet after that, so you had, even if you wanted to say um, 190 square feet um, or 200 square feet, 190 square feet. You could actually put then someone into your living room as well because you still have then the space. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. One additional clarification. Yes, Mr. Monson. Again, part of this is to have available tools to assist in the health and safety of our community and to allow 
uh, people to argue that, that it is okay to put 16 people in a three-bedroom home because our code right now does not prohibit it, we do not believe is in the best interest of, of the community. So that's why we're asking for you to adopt this. Um, it really will, again, be discretion of the individual code enforcement officers based on the context of the circumstance. But we really are trying to prevent what we've seen in other communities of tragic overcrowding, uh, particularly in light of um, potential fires and other things. So that's really the purpose of that particular item. Uh, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. It seems like since forever that law enforcement has been receiving the complaint that there's 15 or 20 people living in this particular home. And it takes up a lot of resources, the parking, the trash, and all of these kinds of things. <clears throat> Would this allow enforcement of controlling those numbers of people again depending on the context of the size of the home yes it would it would at least allow a tool to be used to identify where overcrowding is significantly impacting the community okay having said that both of us <clears throat> something that would concern me is we talked in great depth earlier tonight about homeless people and and what to try to do and that hasn't been settled as to how we're going to resolve that we did talk a lot about it but we don't have a final resolution or even a resolution that's close to final this is something that's going to have to be treated very judiciously because if if we start enforcing something like that we're going to put more people on the street and we're going to exacerbate the homeless issue and, and I got to think a couple of different ways here. If we have a homeless person that's depositing human waste and they're living in a car, I, I can get close to that and say, okay, we got to do something about that. But if we've got 15 people living in a house and somebody has to relieve themselves, I'd rather they did it in a flush toilet, even though they might be violating the safety uh, uh, as we see it of having too many people live in the house so it's going to be a trick to enforce this particular section and not exacerbate the issues of the homeless people in the street and I would hate to see Mr. Cordero, one problem make another Mr. one Mr. Cordero, could you speak into your mic, please? I would, like to see, I, would not like, I would not want to see solving something like that cause more trouble for the current existing problem of homeless. We absolutely agree. And the next presentation with respect to the Code Compliance and Code Enforcement Division will show you the professionalism of my officers. But I'll tell you truthfully, we go on a complaint base and generally, we're not looking for those kinds of elements, but we're looking for those homes that are creating Problems. significant complaints in the community or with law enforcement. And this is simply another tool that we may have available that we do not have now. We're not going out looking to put people on the street. What we are is looking to eliminate problems that, that we are identifying or law enforcement is identifying. But I do appreciate your concern, and uh, the discretion of my officers will be part of this. Thank okay. You. Thank you, because I think these people are being abused by the, the landlords. Thank you. Okay. Bring it back to the council. Can I hear a motion? Okay. We are on 5B. Yes, Madam Mayor. Um, make a motion to introduce an ordinance for the first reading and continue to the next meeting for second reading and adoption, amending chapters 9 through chapters 9 through 1 through 9 through 19 of Title 9 of the City of Santa Maria Municipal Code concerning building and fire regulations and adopting the International Property Maintenance Code. Do I have a second? Oh, I'll second that. I have a <clears throat> motion and a second to introdu introduce ordinance amending Title 9 of the Santa Maria Municipal Code concerning building and fire regulations. Um, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Do, do we didn't do... So. Yeah, I, I did public comment. The, the uh, yeah. other the motion included the additional language for the fireworks that we added up on the screen. I just want to make sure oh, that oh, was oh, included I'm sorry. in there. Oh, yeah, was include... 
Yeah, yeah I can make that part of the motion. Okay, okay. thank okay. you. And the second motion. And the second also, Ms. Dr. Motes? Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Did I miss the discussion part? Go ahead. <laughs> thank you. Um, I appreciate Council Member Cordero's um, comment. Um, my concern is um, similar, you know, I just, I want to make sure that before we, we put something in place um, that could restrict that uh, occupancy limitations that we have something also in place to ensure that in the event of people being displaced that, um, or people getting cited that I, I just, I don't want to make the housing problem worse. And none of us do. None of and us do, because we, we know that. Right, right. Yeah. And so, yeah, and so I, I guess I'm just concerned about the IPMC, and um, maybe it's because I don't understand it well enough, and, um, you know, I don't know if it would be possible for us to vote on this item separate from, or just vote on the ordinance removing the IPMC and then having it come back so that we have more time to read it and. I don't agree with that. I think we need more tools for our code enforcement officers to proceed. And just as um, our city attorney indicated, we don't go looking for these problems. We do it on a complaint basis. And I want to honor those people who do have these complaints that live their life normal and leave it at that. I, I, think, I think the code enforcement officers need as many tools as they possibly can, especially in, in today's uh, world. So I, I would not agree to that. My question would be, what would we accomplish by postponing this uh, to, to a, a later time? What, what would we accomplish by doing that? Yeah, so for me, it's just that I, I want more time to look it over and have more information. Um, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm just frankly concerned. I don't know if this is going to make our housing problem worse or, or make it better. I, I don't and think if, it's, and if someone, yeah. if someone can ex give me more, I mean, yeah, I don't think it's going to, me. one way or the other, I think it's just giving more tools to, like said, to code compliance because they really need that. None of us want to see that happen in this community. And we, we understand uh, the overcrowding. We understand the families that are living uh, in the conditions they're living. And so um, I think Mr. Watson explained that the and professionalism. That's the and that's the professionalism, difference it will make. They need them today. They've been, they've been doing code enforcements with one hand tied behind their back, and they need both of them. So it's very important that we give them the tools. Well, That's a difference. Your comment right there rises concern for me from what I said earlier, and that is that if we're going to go out and start to enforce this excessive number of people in a home, we're going to drive more people into the street. And these people that would be driven into the street, we got no control over that. We got, we, we might have women and children that are trying to go to school and now they're living under the bridge at the, in the, in the, uh, in the uh, our, our code enforcement is not gonna do that, Mr. That's, Cordero. That's what, that's what he said. But, yeah. but, but it, with Ms. Waterfield's comment there that we wanna give these people this, this right to go out and do this, uh, I'm hearing one thing from her and another from Mr. Watson. So, Mr. So, Watson, Mr. Cordero, uh, Councilmember Cordero, uh, I think, and I, and I may be wrong, uh, Councilmember Waterfield's comments, but the the code itself has multiple tools. Mm -hmm. This is one aspect of it, and I would be more than happy to invite any council member on a ride along with my code enforcement officers to review the circumstance. And I assure you and the community. There is no intent of going out and looking for occupancy elements. It's just another tool. But the, the bigger tools included in the IPMC <coughs> include the ability to have enforceability in backyards, enforceability for weeds and fire hazards, enforceability for hoarding and some other issues that we regularly see. That is, that is an element of urgency, and I would echo what Councilmember Waterfield says. Those are tools we could use uh, immediately to make an impact in the community. And but I can also assure Councilmember Soto, Councilmember Cordero, uh, Cordero um, 
the city attorney's office, the code enforcement division is not looking to be occupancy police. It's just another tool. Absolutely, and I want to state for the record that Mr. Cordero misinterpreted my description of what I was trying to, to do, so he's completely wrong on that aspect of what my intentions are. Okay, I have a motion and I have a second. Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Councilmember Soto? No. And Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. The next order of business is a regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will receive an update on code enforcement activities and provide direction to staff on the Council's priorities for code enforce the Code Enforcement Division. Thank you. Um, staff report is to be given by Code Compliance Supervisor Ms. Castang. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council Members. Um, I would like to start by introducing staff to Council. Um, Officer Celia Lennon, um, Officer Palacios, Officer uh, Frank Santos, and Yvette Fuentes. Um, they're all part of our staff and they're very, very happy to be here and uh, they're super amazing. Um, we're pleased to be here to provide you an update um, and also obtain some direction to staff on council's priorities for the division. To start, I'd like to provide you a little background. The code enforcement division operates under the city attorney's office with a supervisor, four officers, one code technician, and a part-time assistant clerk. Each time our office receives complaints, we perform investigations, which may result in uh, notices of violation. They could result in citations, um, administrative hearings with our primary goal for case closure. In many cities of others, uh, in many cities, code enforcement programs only operate within specialized areas of their respective municipal codes. This leaves departments responsible for the enforcement of code violations applicable to their duties. For example, other code enforcement departments may address issues related to blight only, leaving enforcement of in expired business licenses to finance, enforcement of fire code violations to the fire department, and enforcement of unpermitted building to the building department. This process is inefficient, ineffective, and can be very frustrating to the residents who may end up with multiple inspections and or citations issued by various departments because it's all handled separately. In Santa Maria, our code enforcement officers address the entire municipal code, except for a couple sections in Title VII, and act as the code enforcer for every department within the city. This process ensures all code violations are addressed consistently, correctly, fairly, and in an efficient manner. Departments are able to rely on our code enforcement officers for assistance, and do not need to hire their own specialized employees. This efficiency saves time for city staff and other departments and is beneficial to the public because residents get to deal with one point of contact rather than multiple departments and multiple inspections. Over the last year, uh, Code Enforcement Division has accomplished some really amazing things. Uh, we have been able to close 1,600, over 1,600 cases. Nine of those cases alone involved 5,000 of our residents. We handled 21,000 phone calls, 1,900 violations were reported, and 206 uh, compliance orders were issued. It's also interesting to note how we've changed over the years. Uh, in 2015, as you can see in the slide, we had a, a few items. We took in complaints from the public. Uh, we had some proactive work and worked with a couple departments along with some outreach. 
Whereas in 2019, we've, through efficiencies and really taking a close look at our processes and growing with technology, in 2019, our office now handles a great deal more. We have taken on some significant, very significant tasks that are creating some large impacts on public safety and quality of life. Residents, uh, to highlight a few, um, to highlight a few, the code division took on a substandard housing case that did involve nine properties. There were about 4,000 violations on those properties, and it again affected 5,000 Santa Maria residents. These residents are now safer in their homes. The, involve, the cases actually involved cockroaches. Um, those were actual pictures. Um, we had some bed bug cases. We've dealt with mold uh, and severely unsafe conditions. And these are a major priority of our department in keeping the community safe and improving quality of life. Our involvement with homeless has also increased. We work side by side with community services unit of the police department uh, and with the rangers. We address the property itself while the police and rangers address the individuals. We work with Home for Good, Salvation Army, Good Sam, and other nonprofits to help get folks off the streets. Massage facilities in some instances have become a means for human trafficking and prostitution. We again work closely with PD and utilities to try to abate some of these activities. Uh, over the last year, we also have begun to work closely with the fire department and some of the challenges they're facing with the state-required residential inspection program. With all that being said, over the last year, we have also observed some growing trends, in increasing increases in overgrown weeds, personal property and public view, inoperable vehicles, unregistered vehicles blocking sidewalks. One of the most interesting that we started to come across uh, this year was a lot of the unpermitted food sales that have been in some very unsafe situations and locations. In the photo above, you can see that there was actually some antifreeze that was being stored for food for sale to the public. Uh, in this one, it was for some tamales, and they were storing a lot of that in sheds outside. Back in 2015, Council allowed code staff to pursue the following items proactively. We took care of junk trash and debris, inoperable vehicles, parking and blocking on sidewalks, parking on unpaved, weeds, broken windows, and illegal signs. What the Code Enforcement Division requests from City Council is some guidance on whether the division should continue to proactively enforce only those items, or as an alternative, add overflowing trash cans or autonomy to proactively enforce blight violations based on, the obs based on their observation of problem areas while we're in the field. If this list will only be expanded, the Code Enforcement Division requests Council's proactive enforcement authority to include overflowing trash cans. Many complaints we receive are in reference to loose trash within the city, when trash cans are left overflowing, with the lids not in place, loose trash resurfaces on neighboring properties and streets, which leads to unsightly conditions and clogged storm drains. By directing the Code Enforcement Division to also address overflowing trash cans, staff may be able to help reduce some of the loose trash found within the city. Ideally, we would like autonomy over proactive enforcement. This will allow the, the Code Enforcement Division to review field conditions and address problem areas before they become widespread. Currently, if a violation is not on the proactive authority list, 
and a service request form is not issued, the violation does go unremedied until, because we have no authority to proactively work on it. Um, now moving forward, in 2019, uh, with new leadership in the Code Enforcement Division and City Attorney's Office, uh, we have made improved data collection a priority for this year and into the future. The Code Enforcement Division has spent the last few months reviewing how it has collected and utilized data in the past. Our analysis of past practices has shown there's some room for improvement. The Code Enforcement Division has begun efforts to improve data tracking and utilization to better demonstrate our role within the city. <coughs> the Code Enforcement Division is committed to providing council and city data uh, of its activities to ensure residents are fully informed of the continuing efforts being made to improve the quality of life by our, for our residents. We also plan to assume the responsibility of the weed abatement program from Public Works. This is in an effort to continue to provide greater support and streamline efficiency throughout our city departments. The Code Enforcement Division plans on taking over the weed abatement program later this year. This program historically has been executed by the Public Works Streets and Facilities Division. In the past, Code Enforcement has worked with Public Works to seek compliance, and once the program is transitioned to the Code Enforcement Division, all enforcement and cleanup will be administered by us. We're also really excited about a new approach in seeking compliance. Um, it's called Targeted Proactive Enforcement. It was a combination of all of code staff that kind of put this program together to include Jeff Patrick. Um, the code enforcement plan, or the code enforcement division, um, will highlight a section in the specific in a specific area of the of the code um, that's going to be enforced proactively um, for a designated period of time. Prior to issuing any citations or anything, we'll have a public awareness that will go out. Um, we can do this through media and through flyers um, from the board that's out front, this kind of thing, to help do it as a way to let folks know what's required of them <coughs> under the municipal code and how we can get it fixed uh, before it becomes an issue. Um, and at this time, um, I'd like to thank you so much for allowing me to speak with you. And at this point is the consensus that we're moving in the right direction and the priorities are correct, or do you see that something should be modified? Uh, Madam Mayor, yes. if I may as well, yes. um, because I, I cannot uh, allow it to be unsaid. I am incredibly proud of the individuals who provide this service to a town of over 100,000 and do it, F, you know, on, honestly, night and day, they really work hard. And, um, and I'm just very proud that, uh, that they represent this city so well. So I'll leave that, if, and then you can, you can hammer us later. <laughs> yeah, I, th I think you're going in a great direction. And, and of course, I'm calling you guys all the time, as you well know. Um, and there's things that you know I would like to see you continue to do. And uh, the trash cans, I think, are a real issue. And I've had people complain because there are neighborhoods where all the trash cans are out in plain view. Now, let me ask you something on trash cans, though. Um, sure. Because there are some places that don't have a green waste or don't have a recycle. Do they just put everything, mm. recycle everything into one can? I'm assuming. I'm assuming that they do. Um, that would be a great question um, for utilities. Utility, okay. Um, I know that there are some that don't have both, but mm -hmm. typically you're supposed to have both. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I, I know there's a lot of them in my neighborhood that don't have both. Oh. So, mm -hmm. I do okay. know that. I can totally let Dave know and find out for you. Dr. Motes? Yeah, I'd like to know how overflowing a trash can has to be to be considered overflow situation. Like that. 
<laughs> in the picture. Yeah. Yeah, that was actually a pretty good one. Um, overflowing is if your lid does not close sufficiently. And the main reason for that is when you kind of think of it doesn't go back fast enough. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, when it, it's, it's just enough above. I think the code is for what utilities goes with is like four or five inches, but I think I'm not positive on that. What you're really trying to do is make sure it closes all the way because it's almost like it closes it all. It doesn't have like a section. But when it's windy, it's less likely to blow over. So in an instance like this, especially the picture on the left, um, a good windy day, um, which Santa Maria has a lot of, <laughs> that trash is going to go everywhere mm -hmm. and go into all kinds of neighborhoods and into people's yards. So you always kind of want to push it down as much as you can and put your lid down. <laughs> Yes, yes yeah. Ms. Waterford. Um, I, I, I do agree with uh, uh, the mayor in regards to the overflow trash cans that I would like to see you do, but the exposed ones too. A lot of people keep their trash cans in their driveway, and they have a perfectly good fence they could put it behind. And uh, the ones I have seen and the people that have complained to me, they eventually get boxes leaning up towards the trash can, and it just gets, it just gets messy. And um, one, of the, one of the complaints was um, she asked a neighbor to please put her trash cans behind the fence. And she goes, well, I don't want to see it from the backyard. <laughs> and her response was, I don't want to see it from your front yard either. So if we can just go ahead and you know, monitor that as well, that, that would be a good high priority. Okay. Um, um, Ms. Soto? Thank you. Thank you for, for your work. Um, and for me, one of the biggest priorities would really be your um, collaboration with um, our fire department and um, fire codes. You know, safety is, is key. And so um, thank you for doing that. I do have a question. Um, like with, with landlords whose properties we have to red tape, what do we have? What happens to the families who live there? They, they have to, they, I'm assuming they have to leave, right? Um, yeah, uh, we rarely do red tags okay. on, it's, it's extremely rare. In the uh, last 10 years, 11 years, I think maybe we've done that six or seven times um, in total. They're very extreme cases. And when that happens under state law, the property owner is supposed to relocate. So when those instances happen, we always make sure that there's somewhere for someone, somewhere to go. Thank you. Um, and then we also follow up with legal aid and let everybody know where their rights are and that kind of thing as well. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, did you say that the the uh, owner then has to relocate that person? Yeah. yeah. Okay. It, especially if it's something that was created sure. um, by that lack sure. of maintenance on a home. Any questions here? No. Okay. So, so so okay. Let me get back to the trash can thing. <laughs> so so you'll do an education type thing, telling so people we can that bring we'll, we'll their trash that cans. That is our first targeted. Um, and educate them yeah. to, and as we'll to the with, use. We'll start with that, yeah. and we'll start with the education with trash. Okay, cans. and as to the use of the the two trash cans. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Because I, I think a lot of people aren't doing the recycle. So. Yeah, and I can talk with Dave Portwood Okay. because um, he always is real good with knowing if there's any reasons for why some folks may not have them, um, and we can go from there. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions? Mr. Watson, did you? Just want to make it clear, I, I think we have a consensus that we're, we're going in the right direction, but yes. uh, trash cans are, are going to be a proactive <laughs> priority for and us. And then once we get those in, then we'll go on to some. There, you know, there's... People are pretty good about not parking on the lawns lately. I don't see a lot of that going on. We enforce. <laughs> oh, okay. So they're getting the, they're getting the message. Yeah. Okay. Madam Clerk, do we have any written correspondence? Uh, we have a, re a request to speak. We have a request to speak on this item. Okay. Yes. Okay, Nancy Stewart. 
thought you were part of the code compliance group, Nancy. <laughs> Nancy Stewart, 901 West Main Street. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, just for information, I was on the original Code Compliance Appeals Board probably 15 years ago or something like that. It's been, and I was on it for quite a long time. Maybe it was 20 years, but I just resigned from that a couple of years ago. Um, and then <coughs> all my comments are going to be my personal thoughts today. But I want to tell you. You have a code compliance department that is so professional. They do their job so well. But you know what? They need at least five more employees. <laughs> they are working so hard, and they do their job so well, and they cover so much territory. But I want you to know, next time you get a bunch of windfall of money, that the code compliance department needs more people. <laughs> um, they, they just <laughs> I, I really believe that. I, and, you know, having been close to some of this for so many years, I see so many things around town that need to be cleaned up. But I, I guess to make it short, is I, I totally agree that they need to be proactive about anything they need to do because this city has a problem. And they have done everything they can, but we have so much that needs to be done. The cars, the on the streets, the cars on the lawn, the broken down cars, the trash cans, the broken windows, the signs. The, but the second part of this is I want them to also concentrate on the business district. We talk about making a beautiful city. People come into the business district first, even if they're coming to your house or my house later. They see the city downtown business district first. And we need to be sure that those businesses are well kept outside the appearance. There's signs, if, if the lighting is out, the, they need to be relit, they need to be fixed. If their banners have been up for six years and they're so faded you can hardly read them and they're windblown, they need to be taken down. They need to get permits for these kind of things and understand. One thing that I did mention to uh, somebody in the planning department on the, on the uh, planning board, I would like to see and, and it is required, I believe the fire department requires it, numbers on the businesses and homes, but numbers that you can identify, you can see them as, a, as you go, go past the business and you're looking for a certain one, if you don't see a name out there, you're looking for 501 West Main Street or something, you have to be able to see that number. The town is not a tiny town anymore. I know the streets mostly, but I don't know the newer streets, but I don't know whether I'm in the 500 block or the 1200 block or the 2200 block. We need to have numbers at least to identify the blocks. Yeah. And Let me ask, I have lots of thoughts on are those Are those required now, but we just don't enforce? They, they are required someplace, yes, but they, okay. they, they need to be enforced. And my suggestion was to enforce it on the newer remodeling or newer construction to be sure that as part of their final permit that they have those numbers out there so we can find them. Does that Yes, yeah. Mr. Well, Silva. Madam Mayor, members of the council, one of the updates in the fire code was to have the letters, go, the numbers go from six inches to 12 inches. Okay, that's fine. Are we going to enforce it? Yes. Are we just, yeah. okay. Yeah, that, that's that's all the okay. And, and it's a big thing to enforce uh, time-wise. And so my suggestion was as there's any remodeling or updating buildings okay. or any new buildings, they need to have it on there. Because the town's growing. And people come from other town and want to see the businesses in whatever block and they can't find it. Okay, these are all my personal thoughts. We are doing a great job. These co oh, one last thought. When I was on the board before, we decided to call this code compliance rather than code enforcement. It just sounds friendlier. I don't know if that has to be legal or if it's changed or if they have the reasons for changing it, but I like code compliance better than code enforcement. It's not being so punishable even if it is. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nancy. Appreciate that. Okay. I'll, um, do we, did I uh, take, oh yeah, public comment, that was Nancy, okay. I'll bring this back to item to the council for discussion and direction. I think we've given direction and, yeah, I you, got, you have, got the direction. We have clear direction and full, we will look forward to going ahead. forward. Okay, great. 
Okay, do I hear a motion? There's no motion. There's no motion. Oh, I'm sorry. Direction. Okay, direction. Next order of business is another regular business item. Madam Clerk. Madam Mayor. Oh, can, can we yeah. like have a 10 minute break? Sure. Good. Okay, we'll do this for two and a half hours. Okay, we'll do a 10 minute break. <clears throat> I was fine.
staff and public. Before I make my presentation, I would like to let the council and audience know that the original report that I provided had an, uh, needed an update, and we provided that to the dice to um, earlier today. And uh, just so you know where the change was made, it's on the second page, the first chart. Uh, the balance starts of year, that amount, had a transposition of two numerals. And the report you have now is correct. So I wanted to let you know that. So now I will briefly present the quarterly financial report for the first quarter in September 30th, 2019. I will be primarily reviewing the general fund, including Measure U, and Enterprise Funds. The beginning general fund balance of $10,071,000 is the unaudited balance at July 1st, 2019. Concerning city revenues through the first quarter of the year, sales tax receipts are just over $74,000, or 1.2% greater than the first quarter last year. The slight increase is due to sales growth in building and construction and business and industry categories. This growth, these, excuse me, this sales growth was offset by ongoing problems with the state sales tax reporting system, which has created a significant increase in the number and the dollar amount of adjustments needed in future periods to correct previous allocations. NHIS revenue is at nearly 60% of budget at just under 595,000, with an annual budget of a million. The, this compares to receipts through the first quarter of last year of 281,000, or an increase of approximately 314,000. The majority of the NHIS material received during the first quarter of 2019-20 came from Chevron's San Luis Obispo Cape Farm Project, and also we had also received material from Chevron's Casmalia Mineral Fee and Shell Oil's Cat Canyon lease. The city expects to continue receiving material from the tank farm project in October, but then the decline in material is anticipated during the winter rainy months. It is hard to predict when hauling will resume after the rainy season, and as a result, revenues are uncertain for the second half of the year. Permit revenue is at 20% of budget, or approximately 523,000. It is at is 8.8% lower than the first quarter of last fiscal year. Commercial construction activity is steady, and two significant projects at Enos Ranch, the Easton Pro Apartments, and Honda are currently in the permitting process. Turning to the general fund expenditures, they are about 22% of budget and include 1.3 million in salary savings. Staff feels confident that with first quarter savings and existing vacancies, we are on course to realize the 2.2 million in salary savings included in the 2019-20 budget to help address the budget deficit. However, expenditures are still projected to exceed revenue estimates by about 2.2 million. Concerning Measure U, revenues through the first quarter are slightly over budget at 26.7% or 5156000 Expenditures are at 18.3% of budget and approximately $1.3 under budget. The majority of the budget underrun is due to the time it takes to hire 57 new positions, in particular those in police and fire. Also, some recreation and parks and library service enhancements will begin later in the year. Staff anticipated and the City Council authorized as part of the 1920 mid-cycle budget $900,000 of salary savings to establish reserve funds for the future economic downturns. On October 15, 2019, the City Council also authorized $193,000 of salary savings to be used to fund a portion of the new shooting range for police. Through September, 94% of Measure U expenditures have been spent on public safety, 3% on youth services, and 3% on quality of life. As, as for the enterprise funds, the water and wastewater fund revenues exceeded expenditures by 5,800, which is about 1.8 million less than last year. This significant variance is due to nearly 1.5 million increase in state water payments. Expenditures include the semi-annual debt service payment of 746,000 of interest 
on the 2012 refunding bonds. The remaining principal and interest payment of $3.9 million will occur in the third quarter of the fiscal year. For the, <coughs> excuse me, for the solid waste fund, revenues exceeded expenditures by $83,700. Operational expenses are about 10.9% or 510,000 greater than the previous year, but revenues are up 8.4% or 738,000. The transit fund first quarter revenues are more than expenditures by nearly 1.3 million, primarily due to receipt of grant reimbursements for prior period expenditures. Fair revenues for the quarter are just over 186,000 and the fare box ratio is 24.8%. In conjunction with the first quarter financial report, staff is recommending five of six budget amendments presented for council's consideration. That concludes my staff report and I'm available to answer any questions you may have. Any questions? I just yes, want to make Waterfield. a comment on the, on the state water. When you look at the revenues, uh, and this year, and um, Mr. Springer's right here, even though the, the revenues exceeded the expenditure by only $5,800. That still is great in what we, our debt service is for state water. And, you know, we're in it for the long haul, but we do get high quality water that makes a whole difference in the city of Santa Maria. So um, it, um, it, it looks good even though it's, it's a low amount. It could be worse, that's all I can say, but it, 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 it looks good. Any other questions? I, I just have a comment, Mr. Madam Mayor. Thank you. Uh, I, it just amazes me, uh, Mary, that uh, sometimes I admit that I have to read this thing. I've read it as many as three times sometimes to, to get my arms around it. And it just amazes me how you take <laughs> such a mountain of paperwork and data and reduce it down to a few pages so that the five of us can better understand it. So I really appreciate the efforts that your office does and yourself as you get involved in, in, in presenting this to us. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank you. Dr. Yeah, Moses. I had a quick question on the non-hazardous waste. Um, we used to get a lot of that um, from the, what was it, the Unical project in uh, Guadalupe Beach? And I read an article in the newspaper that says they're going to try and uh, detoxify the soil on site by building a facility out there to do it. So I anticipate that we're not going to be getting much more money from them. I would say that if, if that does, if they do get that approval, that would certainly end that, that stream. There is, I know the Tank Farm Road has a um, considerable amount too, but mm -hmm. I, I'm not sure the, the volume. I don't know if um, Mr. Springer knows that offhand, but... Um, Yeah, I'd say, um, Madam Mayor, members of the council, Dr. Motes, I, overall, right, the, um, the NHIS revenue stream has a risk based on um, uh, the economics of delivery, and you're correct in that one of the primary sources that we have is looking to do on-site uh, retention of the soil. It's not a, an approved, uh, it's a, right now it's a concept and not an approved permit to do so, and, and Mr. Springer can expand on it. Oh, great. Mr. Springer. Thank you, Mr. Stella. Um, Councilmember Motes. Basically, just to reiterate what you've already heard, the uh, Chevron project at Guadalupe Dunes, they are looking at uh, remediation projects on site, including up to essentially landfilling or encapsulating the materials on site. Uh, that is occurring in San Luis Obispo County, so they're the lead agency with respect to permitting and, and what would be allowed under CEQA. Um, as Mr. Stilwell mentioned, the NHIS program is really reliant on um, market forces and the desire to clean up by the oil companies. Um, that, uh, over the years, has been driven by a number of things. One is um, the price of crude oil, the amount of money that the oil companies have available for remedi remediation and cleanup. It's also um, driven potentially by property values, as in the case of the tank farm project in San Luis Obispo. So if there's an opportunity to do a remediation or a cleanup there, as well as maybe reutilize the property for greenfields or things of that nature. So um, looking forward, I know that the uh, vendor that we use for the NHIS program has expressed concern uh, over the last year with the continuing um, consistency of the revenue stream program for the NHIS. 
uh, that we take in out at the landfill. So as we move forward, that's something we'll definitely be keeping our eye on. Would Tank Farm consider remediation on site too? <laughs> that has not been something that they would consider in that location. In, in regards to the Chevron at Guadalupe, it has to be board approval by the uh, San Luis Obispo County boards. Chevron is um, wanting to do a landfill out there and, and redo that, but so far there has been two supervisors that have expressed uh, absolutely not for that to happen. And so, um, which would be good for Santa Maria. We, that's exactly what we want, and we should all be talking to the Board of Supervisors, advising them to, you, you don't want those, those soils, uh, because Chevron doesn't want to take those soils to Kettleman uh, mm. Farm over there, too. That's just way too costly for them. So we're talking millions and millions of dollars to um, bring the NHIS to Santa Maria to, from the Chevron, and that doesn't include Tank Farm. What about the Coastal Commission, though? Would they allow that on there, to, them to do that? It's too close to the water. I mean, it's, uh, yeah. unless they've got, you know, I mean, look what they did with Phillips 66. Yeah. It's just, um, I, I can't imagine the yeah. Coastal Commission allowing them. Who knows? Yes. Um, I have questions on the amendments, on the proposed amendments. Um, First off, congratulations to our fire department for getting the SAFER grant. That's really exciting. Um, but in respect to um, hiring the over the hiring the six over hires for the fire department, um, I'm just wanting to ask how does this affect um, pension costs in the future, and is this something that's sustainable for the city of Santa Maria? <clears throat> so um, regarding pension costs, so the new employees coming in will be tier three employees, so they have a lower pension rate and lower pension costs to the taxpayers, to the, to the city. Um, and whether it's sustainable, I think we'll see that with the next year's budget is it is going to be difficult to maintain our levels of service. We are prioritizing public safety as, as a priority for the service. And these are, as outlined in the budget uh, report, uh, these are over hires in order to, for us to have efficiencies during the academy with known and expected um, retirements and uh, vacancies um, in the near horizon. So I think it's a good step on management's part and the chief's part in particular to be able to look forward and see what our needs are going to be and to be proactive in addressing those needs and um, running a, a recruitment class that anticipates those needs rather than re reacting to it afterwards. It says on here, um, pending discussions with Local 2020. Can you explain that to me? Sure. So it, um, it, we, had, we were in the process of a meet and confer with the labor groups about this. Um, um, the overhires would uh, have potential impacts, and so we want to make sure we discuss those potential impacts with the labor groups. So if they don't agree with it, and we've already voted, so we're being we're asked to vote on something that no uh, no. no I oh. believe it's a meet and confer so oh. rather than um, anything that needs to be negotiated right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. <laughs> Thank you Madam Mayor. This is this this over hire as you put it is not this is not the chief arbitrarily just increasing the size of the department. This is just for a brief period of time so that when these other people leave the department. We're ready to make a seamless transition between the exiting personnel and the incoming personnel. There's two big issues with um, adding fire staff. One is uh, the academy and training them, and that's a, a very uh, regimented, structured program to get new employees up to speed and to run them through drills and, and um, exercises to be able to um, train them and test them. and. Um, uh, it's yeah, it's it's a, an anticipation of what our future uh, needs are going to be, and so it's anticipating um, building the the academy to anticipate the future needs. So no, you're right; it's not arbitrary. Thank you. Any other questions? Would all of them be a station? Okay. Uh, be at station one? No. Okay. Ah. Chief Champion. 
So looking back at the number of academies we had, we lose cadets through academic reasons. They fail out, they wash out of the academy. Uh, they cannot physically perform the job and will, will also um, not complete the academy or through injury. Uh, there have been instances where cadets have gone to other agencies during the academy or during probation. All those losses will find ourselves right back in to looking at putting on an additional academy. All that takes money and time, and so we're trying to offset that by doing this overhire. So it's going to save money and time in the long run, and any of those successful candidates, and we're looking at five at this point, not six, so any five candidates that make it through the academy successfully and they hit the floor uh, on or about eight, middle of April of next year, um, they will be spread out. And that's what we're trying to figure out is how they're going to be utilized, where they're actually going to go. Ideally, we'd like to see them assigned to a crew and a station so that they can get focused training, get focused supervision during their uh, remaining of their probation so they can be evaluated properly. Thank you. Sure. Any other questions? Just how do much? How much does he? How much does it cost the city of Santa Maria to put cadets, um, future possible future firefighters through our academy? So once we look at bringing staff from a traditional work shift schedule onto a 40-hour, we have to convert a number of cadre to do that, along with materials and um, support logistics. It could cost anywhere of thirty, forty thousand uh, dollars for an academy, and that's just a normal size academy, and so it's it's quite expensive. One of the great things that we were able to do is that Captain Clayton, our grant writer, was able to get us a safer grant. So we're getting one point six million dollars over the next three years to help offset um, uh, bringing on these the uh, personnel and. Part of the requirement for that grant is to maintain existing staffing. So if we have identified vacancies, we have to actively be pursuing to fill those vacancies. This overhire will ensure, if we get that direction, will ensure that we maintain that per the, the grant. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Clark, do we have any requests to speak? Not on this item, Madam Mayor. Okay. I'll bring this back to the council for discussion and a motion. Oh, sorry. sorry. There's just so much on this agenda. Um, recreation and parks. Um, the um, it says defer to 2020-2022 budget cycle. The request for appropriation of the four hundred and four thousand dollars for the two community centers drop in. Um, I have two questions. Um, you know, when I first brought this issue up. Um, when residents approached me asking to have these facilities opened, um, you know, I mean, I understand that at this point we may not have the money to fully fund six days per week, four hours per day, but my hope was to have at least these two community centers open just for, you know, a couple of weeks out of the year, dr primarily during the 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 weeks when school season is out, especially during like spring break when it's a little bit more of a rainy season so that students have somewhere to play. So the co what's the, what would be the cost for something like that? And as Alex is coming up here, so this item it was an item that was discussed by the council during the budget hearing. Um, there wasn't funding uh, in the budget to remain to maintain a balanced budget to include this. The uh, council deferred it till the first quarter to see if there was money available at the first quarter. We're, after coming through the first quarter budget, we still don't see money available for it, so we're re requesting to defer it. But as Councilmember Soto um, alludes. The uh, number we have there of the 404,000 is to fully provide the two facilities open for those hours and days provided, and it is they can can be um, provided for fewer hours. And I'll have uh, Director Posada describe that potential. Thank you, Mr. Sowell, Councilmember Soto, members of the City Council. So, what we're able to do is we looked at the at the cost to operate a program. Uh, if we looked at specialized time uh, during the holidays, you know, those kinds of situations, we're looking at roughly about 
$250 uh, an hour to offer a program at a facility. So if you, it would be you know, $500 if you were doing two facilities. Um, the issue that it kind of creates for us um, is being able to bring staff on for very short periods of time. Uh, so what we would have to do is in our existing staff, we would have to figure out a way to take people from one program and move them over to, to work on this particular program. So that's a, a logistical problem that you know we can work with. Uh, but basically, if you wanted to figure 250 to 300 dollars an hour is about what it costs to run a program. Would this be something that we would be able to pay for through Measure U, the youth portion? I would have to defer that. Right. So, uh, based on that nod, I must, yes, Measure U is a possible funding source for that, yes. Great. Is it, so now do I? So we, the, the, we were conferring here because I think uh, how it would work on the accounting is if the council added um, this expenditure to whatever amount, then it would come out of the potential set aside for the Measure U reserve of the 900000 Wait, say that again. Sorry. Yeah. yeah. So as it stands right now, we don't have the salary savings from that unless we use some of the $900,000 that we, were, we already had set aside mm -hmm. for that. So that, that's how we would pay for it now. Potentially there could be more salary savings, but maybe there's not. So that's, mm -hmm. that's the risk that we're kind of taking. Yeah, yeah I mean, I would mm -hmm. like for us, to, for it to see, I, I mean, again, at least, um, a couple of hours, a couple of weeks out of the year for our youth to be able to use the facilities. Can, can we bring this back, you know, bring this back soon, you know, not wait, bring this back soon and see what you can put together? Because if mm -hmm. it's open like, you know, like you say, like during Easter Wait. break or, mm -hmm. you know, when they, when they could use the facility. And, and I'd like to say I would support something like yeah. that too. It's such a shame to have these beautiful unused buildings when there's a need for them. And in fact, so if that, there's a couple options I heard there. So if it's the pleasure of the council to um, expend some funding and open it some hours, as I'm hearing council members Motes and Soto say, then the council can allocate a certain amount of dollars, say 50,000, it'll give us 100 hours, and then we can report back on what additional hours, or we'll open for additional hours and let the council and the public know what those hours would be. Um, and you can do that today with this <laughs> item as it's agendized, or if you'd prefer to have this item come back and have a further discussion, we can do that too. I, I like that plan. Yeah, yeah I, I'd, I'd like, like to have it come too. back, and so we can yeah. have have the whole thing in front of us and put it together because we wait, certainly are interested wait, in it. The fifty thousand. Yeah. Yeah. I, sorry. The just yeah. have the fifty thousand allocated, um, and then come, come back, back to us. When, when would that be? The, the next quarterly financial so we can, I, it was a t So we can, out, if the council wants to allocate the 50000 now, we will um, build a plan to open the facilities and we'd report back off agenda but notify the public. Or if you would rather have a discussion of when it would be open and how it would be, we can bring that back for council's discussion. I think we would suggest if, you're, if there's interest in looking at expanding, I uh, would suggest um, adding 50000 at this point, mm -hmm. and then we can um, just begin doing the work and be able to notify the public and the council when those additional hours yeah, will be. Yeah, because the $50,000 would give us a good inclination right. of what's needed and, how, you know, the hours and all that kind of stuff for the children. And since we're going into the winter right. and uh, holidays and rainy season, I think that would that would be a great thing to do, the 50000 now. Sure. So. Mr. Cordero, do I see a nod? <laughs> <laughs> or are you nodding off the sleeve? No, no. I, I, you know, I, I have the. I just have a little concern that when you when you do it a couple of times a, a year, and and you suddenly stick in. Well, I got two more hours for you here, and the kids say, "Well, <laughs> we already had plans to do." You know, we didn't. We weren't. It's it's going to be difficult, I think, to to do something twice a year. And and I think that we might lose some kids in, in that, but I I think we got to try it, and 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 see whether or not it will work. So 
So yeah, the nod is there to see whether it's going to work. And okay. if it does, then we've done the right thing. Okay. But it would still be deferred for the total amount, right, for 20, 2022? Mm -hmm. yeah, we'll bring the additional amount back as part of the overall budget. So you can okay. alloc or prioritize this within your overall priority for the upcoming two-year budget. Okay. Thank you. Very good. Okay. Bless you. Okay. Any other questions? I'll bring this item back to the council for discussion. Motion. Any further discussion? The motion. Oh yes, I need public comment. Keep forgetting. No request to speak on the final. Nothing. Okay. No, ri no written. No written comments. Okay. So then I will go ahead and make a motion to adopt a resolution approving the amendments to the 2019-20 budget for per personnel and operating changes for the first quarter ending September 30, 2019, and to add the $50,000 to our rec parks and recreation. Right, for additional community center drop-in use hours. Ditto. Okay, I have a motion. Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, can you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Moats? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. The next order of business is our final regular business item. Madam Clerk, could you please read the title? The City Council will consider an agreement with Rainey and Associates to develop a comprehensive update to the general plan and consider implementing a general plan maintenance fee. Thank you. Staff report will be given by Director of Community Development, Mr. Ng. Good evening, Madam Mayor, members of the Council. I want to provide some background information on a general plan. So a general plan is a vision document for the city containing goals and policies that help the city reach its vision. Target year for this general plan update is 2040. And this comprehensive general plan update is an opportunity to plan Santa Maria for the next 20 years. And there's a photo of our existing general plan. It covers a variety of topics, but primarily, uh, I'll call out a few, uh, land use. In terms of land use, uh, we, through this process, uh, decide what can be built and where. The process will include a review of land use designations, such as residential, commercial, industrial, or other types of uh, uses. The intensity of those land use designations. So for residential, uh, it's how many homes per acre. And this general plan update will also talk about how we grow in the future. What are the future growth areas? Is it infill, is it expansion, annexation, or some combination? As you uh, may know, uh, we're projected to grow by about 30, 35,000 persons and about 10,000 jobs in the next several decades. This would be the plan uh, to analyze and discuss uh, how we accommodate that future growth. The general plan update also includes a circulation element. This is a chapter that discusses how we travel. And you can see the existing image the existing image is uh, our current uh, circulation plan, and it's uh, a network of black lines of varied widths. And uh, we will have an opportunity to review that circulation network and how travel and uh, traffic is distributed throughout the city. With future growth uh, comes future volumes, future traffic volumes, and there will be uh, a traffic uh, model and study that accompanies the, the land use projections. And as part of the plan, we will look at all modes of transportation, vehicle, bicycle, pedestrian. The general plan update also covers other elements. These are uh, required by the state and included in this, uh, house, uh, in this scope is the housing element. And our housing element is due to the state in 2023 and uh, this scope covers and includes a housing element. Also a conservation element that discusses natural resources, water, wildlife, minerals, an open space element, uh, preservation of unimproved areas for open space, a noise element that includes objectives and policies uh, that discuss exposure to excessive noise, a safety element, that discusses impacts from fires, floods, and other hazards. 
and new to uh, relatively new uh, to uh, general plan statutes we uh, the city is required to cover environmental justice which ad addresses health risks for disadvantaged communities as well as air quality an optional element is the economic development element we have an existing economic development element that talks about how we attract jobs and businesses and we anticipate that we will again have that uh, chapter in our general plan element and there could be other chapters depending on the input that we receive uh, from the public or based on uh, the city's priorities we expect that the general plan update will cover current issues that we are seeing and, and trends uh, such as uh, additional state regulations uh, for regulating housing and including uh, ADU regulations we need this is an opportunity for the city to prepare for a changing economy including the decline of traditional retail and also other issues such as farm worker housing affordable housing transportation so this is again uh, the opportunity to have those conversations and as mentioned uh, this will be the opportunity to have conversations on annexation and future growth areas and will include studies for uh, that will look at impacts on uh, future growth and again this is this is not a, a, a one and done this is this will begin that conversation but our hope is that this will set the framework and be a, a living document and not just something that sits on the shelf sits on the shelf we did some initial outreach back in 2018 and uh, and there were some themes that came out of the surveys and the outreach and the major themes that came out of the, our initial outreach includes affordable housing education the enhancement of downtown transportation local business parks health jobs and beautification and th this input that we received back in 2018 uh, helped us draft our scope uh, that we uh, released uh, later in the year so in January uh, through March we uh, issued a request of proposals for uh, this work and we had a meeting with pers prospective consultants in February we received three proposals and we had a team of department directors that reviewed these three proposals we conducted interviews back in April and we do have a recommended consultant the recommended consultant team is Ramey and Associates and this is based on cost estimates and more so uh, the scope uh, scope of work that they proposed uh, for this project we believe that this consultant would provide the highest value and the mo and given their robust scope they were not the most expensive of the three proposals uh, they are mid-range and there was another proposal that was uh, more expensive and there was one that was less expensive however the review, review team felt that they were uh, that they wouldn't meet all of our objectives and there are sub consultants that will be uh, teamed up with this consultant that will cover specific topics such as transportation and uh, environmental there will be uh, this project will have an environmental impact report prepared along with it that would analyze the impacts of various uh, growth scenarios as well as uh, other topics this is a uh, a table of the timeline and so I've discussed what we've um, accomplished so far as far as the initial scoping initial outreach and with the request for proposals uh, if we have a direction from the council to move forward uh, we can expect to spend the next uh, three years uh, working on this project it is very large in scope there are many many tasks and I will provide a, a brief uh, overview of each of the tasks there will be more community engagement there will be a website there will be workshops there will be stakeholder interviews we expect the establishment of advisory committees and these advisory committees will include members from uh, different agencies could be from the school district from could be from the development community uh, and they would provide 
uh, feedback and advice uh, along the way. There will be study sessions with the Planning Commission, and if the Council chooses, there could be a study session along the way. So there'll be a lot of engagement uh, all throughout this entire process, but more so towards the, the beginning as we establish, um, as we develop uh, the growth scenarios. There will be an existing conditions analysis and assessment of what's happening now and, and where we are at today. As discussed, uh, a good p this will lead to the development of a general plan vision. It's, it's one large document, but the document will have, should have a vision statement, and this vision statement will reflect where we want to go in 2040. And along with that vision, there's kind of a, a tiered um, system of vision broken down into goals, goals broken down into objectives, objectives broken down into policies and perhaps specific programs. And in looking at and coming up with a, a vision for the future, we will have different options. There will be a development of different scenarios uh, because we don't expect for there to be just one scenario that's, that everyone agrees on from the beginning. There has to be a, a contrast and comparison and this is required as part of the uh, impact analysis. So we will expect to see perhaps two, three, four uh, different scenarios uh, for the future and this will be deliberated. And also included in the scope of work is our preliminary studies for annexation. We understand that this is something that's important to the council and uh, we will, this scope includes uh, studies, a fiscal study, a land use study, uh, environmental constraint study on how we can uh, move into the future growth areas. And then there's the required task of preparing the actual general plan document. There'll be several drafts, uh, there'll be consultations, there'll be hearings, and as mentioned there, there will be a, a, an environmental impact report as part of the scope of work. Because of the numerous tasks uh, involved, uh, there, the price tag uh, for this proposal is 1.7 million. Uh, and that includes uh, an 8% contingency. This is the general plan and the EIR. The recommendation uh, includes, we, we're asking for a 5% surcharge on a building permit fee to replenish uh, the funds that would be expended for this project. We've heard some concerns uh, from stakeholders uh, regarding this permit fee, and we've expressed uh, um, the willingness to explore options to how to replenish uh, the funds that would be expended for this project. But I wanted to provide a little bit of information on the recommended general plan maintenance fee. Uh, it's, it's not uncommon for cities to, to do this to fund advanced planning efforts. Uh, what's proposed is, again, a 5% surcharge on the building uh, construction permit fee. I provided a couple of examples on what this could mean for some typical permits. Uh, a patio cover, the typical fee is about 250, 270. A 5% surcharge would add $13. The staff report also uh, references a possible 3% surcharge. So the difference with that is the 5% surcharge would replenish the funds in about 12 years. The 3% surcharge would replenish the funds in about 20 years. So for 3%, a patio, the surcharge on the patio cover instead of $13 is probably more like $8. Uh, for an ADU, uh, this would be $128 on top of about $3,000 for the permits. So I provided some examples. And other jurisdictions, uh, we've seen 5% also for Lompoc, 10% for Fresno. And there are other ways to assess. Uh, there are some fees that are based on evaluation as opposed to just a straight surcharge or some jurisdictions impose a, a flat fee. We just wanted to provide some options uh, for the council as far as the ability to <coughs> replenish the funds. 
So this is staff's recommendation that the council uh, adopt the resolution approving the contract with Raymond and Associates to develop the general plan and to in introduce a maintenance fee to be included in the citywide fee study. And that this concludes uh, staff's presentation. Uh, we do have uh, the project manager from Raymond Associates here. Uh, if there are specific questions about uh, the consultants uh, qualities and um, and we also have uh, Ryan Stock Postletter here, plan division manager, who is working very closely on this project. Um, I have a question for Ms. Waterfield. Uh, uh, yes, and your fees that you're talking about, you mentioned <coughs> the three percent fee or the five percent fee or an evaluation. What do you consider to be an evaluation? The is that a fee? Is that a, you look at a project and you're going to evaluate that it's going to be more than three or five percent or? Councilwoman Waterfield, I'll clarify um, that there's some fees that are based on the valuation of the project. So this is, if you remember um, the public art ordinance, mm -hmm. so that proposal is, is, a, is a fee that's based on the valuation of a project. So say uh, there's a proposed commercial development. Usually there will be the, uh, an attached valuation that's part of the permit. And the calculation could be based on valuation, or in this case, the recommendation is a different type of okay. calculation okay. that's based on the permit fee. Uh, my, my, my belief is that this is a little bit more straightforward, <coughs> and therefore, uh, that's, I'm proposing the recommendation to be based on a building permit surcharge. And as far as um, doing patio covers and stuff like that, do we really need to gather that money from uh, people that want to add a patty cover. I know it's eight or thirteen dollars, but it's just the the purpose of is the city really in that bad of shape that we need a to, to do these small tiny projects the, in, in the, the back. Rec Councilman Waterford, the, the recommendation is <coughs> based on simplicity and something that was straightforward. Uh, we would certainly take direction as to uh, how the council would expect or uh, we'd be open to to options. Yeah. I understand the simplicity, but just the um, the message that we're giving, you know, to everybody in the city of Santa Maria that we're just going to start hitting them up for every nickel, dime, and penny that we possibly can <coughs> to uh, make this work for us is is the message that I I'm not really too uh, enthused about about giving. But I did look at the scope of work, and the scope of work is tremendous. Is there going to be somebody working? Is staff going to be working with a consultant? on a daily basis to to make sure and now and you're nodding yes there will be staff so we are understaffed right now so I'm looking at maybe hiring a um, dedicated project manager outside to work with these people that will make it a better flow for our community development department to make sure that it does it does it does go by well because in 19 what when did we do the general plan was 89 to 93 and that took four years to do but that was before internet that was before um, GPS that was before a whole lot that took four years and so in my mind we have come light years ahead of that with all the tools that we have so I'm looking at maybe two years two and a half years at the most to get this plan done and if we have a dedicated project manager that's dedicated slow, to totally to them he can work on a consistent basis with the consultants to make sure that things go smooth fast and well and there's no interruption with staff or anything like that that would it that would um, um, you know, be a delay to other projects or the public. So that's, you know, I'm, I'm looking at trying to make it a smooth process here. Do we have the capacity to hire another staff person? A consultant? <laughs> sure. Uh, Madam Mayor and members of the council, so uh, the planning division Ryan's our uh, <coughs> plan division manager, and we are slowly building the, the, the team back up. As you may be aware, we've had some vacancies, and but we've also hired uh, some planners. We are currently filling the position 
uh, for principal planner uh, that was vacated by Netazair earlier uh, this year. Mm -hmm. So we're open to uh, having more help, but there's a cost associated with that. Also, in regards to timing, and I, I may defer to uh, our consultant team here, that there are a lot of factors that go into uh, the timing of this certain process. There are multiple tasks that are happening at the same time, but there's also uh, kind of a, a, an order to do cert to a certain thing. So with all of the proposals that were submitted, uh, there's, there's, there's a kickoff, there's existing conditions, there's public outreach, and about 12 months in, to about 12 months in, there's the development of a preferred alternative. And, but the time frame after that, there's a lot of work in preparing the EIR. There has to be that analysis of impacts, and, and those items take a certain amount of time. So, and that timing may be independent from whether there's in-house staff shepherding the project and there are just a lot of factors that go into the timing but with that said certainly we're open to mm -hmm. more assistance uh, as long as the, the funding is available to do that well in 1995 they had an update to the general plan and they did do a line item uh, for a million dollars so where is that money now and from 1995 because they, they, they were looking towards sure. you know, saving the money for the next update. Yeah. So we've been saving that all along. Yeah, Madam Mayor, me members of the council, so the council has saved some money over the last couple of years, a couple hundred thousand that has been set aside. Um, and we, uh, part of why this, or the reason this is on tonight's agenda is this was an item that was enabled to be funded in the current budget. And we said, let's take a look after the first quarter and see if we actually do have money for it. And this is another item where we don't have uh, the ability to pay for this project while maintaining our current levels of service. And uh, so as um, Mr. Ng mentioned, that's why we're proposing an additional revenue source in order to keep the project moving forward. And so there are some reserves that we would allocate uh, for this that have been set aside, um, but the additional funding going forward wouldn't be available uh, without what we're proposing of some type of surcharge or additional fee on, on uh, the construction permits or the building permits. So did we, did we use the million dollars already from the 1995? Yeah. Where, where did that go? Yeah, the, the only money that has been set aside was in the last budget. I think we put 125000 a year for the last two years. But what happened before that? In 95? I don't know. It was spent, I guess. It was 20... So we don't know where that money went. Yeah, 25 years That's ago. That's interesting. Yeah. We might have up... We probably had to update the housing element for Rena, or there was probably other um, updates we've had to do on the interim. Okay, and so you, you talked about replenishing the funds, re replenishing what funds for the... Yeah, and so that, yeah, right, that's the broader question. Whether there's funds set aside from 1995 or not, it's still you having to utilize your fund balance in order to do this project. And we're suggesting, we don't recommend you do it because you'll have to use, consider utilizing those funds uh, to maintain levels of service going forward. And um, so the... the uh, what the proposal is today, as, as Mr. Ring mentioned, would be you, we would use some of those reserves uh, to front load this project, to allow the project to get underway. Um, as he mentioned, we have a good consultant team that's eager to go, and we can um, have the council authorize the contract, begin the work, and um, appropriate the funds from reserves for that, and then pay the funds back over either a 12 or 20 year or some other period of time. Um, to replenish the reserves for the council for future services. So you're talking, when you say the funds, replenish the funds, yeah, you're talking about... So you're basically, reserves. I mean, simply speaking, you'd be using, you'd be loaning from your LEAF fund. That's the one um, I'm getting to, at. Okay. And it would be paid back for each of these little um, valuations over the next 12 years or so. So yeah. then the, that fund is named the LEAF fund and that's what we would be replenishing. Yeah, essentially. I mean, it would come out of your overall general fund balance, but yeah. it's essentially borrowing from LEAF. Yeah. 
Yes, Dr. Motes. <clears throat> now, I want to ask a question about the 3 and 5 percent. This would be a levy that would be put on the development community in order to, uh, you know, fund this $1.7 million. Now, we had this public art thing, which I think might be coming up again soon, wherein um, we were thinking of asking the development community to make a donation of one quarter of 1%, and that met stiff opposition. What does the development community think about having to pay 5% on a development project? And wouldn't that adversely affect their profit margin? Madam Mayor and uh, Council, uh, Councilman Miltz, so again, uh, those are two different types of calculations. Uh, one of them is based on valuation, and this is a building permit surcharge. Uh, it's kind of apples to oranges. Ah, oh, um, okay. So, but with that said, uh, the 5% the surcharge is intended to generate about 125000 a year. And uh, I don't know how that compares to what the RP proposes, but I can only speak for this uh, the building permit surcharge. But the development community, they voice their concerns uh, about this surcharge. Uh, they are recommending um, other mechanisms. So that's a lot less than I thought it was going to be. One hundred and twenty-five thousand a year doesn't sound like that much for the development community. So you're saying if a new, if a new applicant came in and was a developer, he'd get charged this regular surcharges for everything that you guys normally do, uh, for whatever it is they're bu building a commercial building. Then would the three or the five percent get tacked on on top of that of all those? It's yes, it's part of the building permit fee. Sounds like it could be a lot more than 100. Well, it depends on if we get any more businesses doing that, but it sounds like mm -hmm. it could be a lot more than that, 125,000. <clears throat> Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. So the additional employee that we may need to work in concert with the uh, people that you're looking at with Ramus, Ramus, is that the name? Ramus? Uh, that their wages would be paid out of the 1.7 million. Madam Mayor and Councilman Cordero, so currently the funding that we're requesting is purely for the consultant proposal and scope of work. Uh, currently that there is no additional funding for a contract planner. So at this point, uh, we were planning to have in-house staff provide project okay. management and coordination with the project consultant. Okay, that was my next question. So how are we going to pay for the services of them if we're spending it on an additional employee? So you're planning on using in-house staff. That, that, that answers my questions both sides. Thank yeah, you very much. I would just reiterate Mr. Uh, Mr. Ng's earlier point, too, that, that by utilizing the in-house staff, a lot of the work comes in fits and starts, and a lot of the work is on the burden of the contractor. So they'll, they're, they'll, do, they'll do a lot of the outreach, a lot of the drafting the documents. So there will be activity, and our staff uh, will be supporting that. But then there's periods of time where the the consultant has to go off and do the analysis or do the work or there's periods of time for review of the of the documents and so that's um, we can utilize our in-house staff on other activities during those lulls. Okay. Thank you. It wouldn't that's be so much of in-house staff but a consultant yeah. that would come in and just work with them and if there's no if there's not anything to do with the consultant then he doesn't do anything. So it's not it's not staff. It's consulting, yeah. Yeah. My only concern with hiring a consultant would be that um, our development staff work, um, I mean, th they know the city like the back of their hand, probably more so than an outside consultant would. And that would be my only concern about hiring an outsider, an out a contractor, or someone who's just hired contract base. Um, when you know our development team 
knows exactly what projects are up ahead. They know the history of the city. Again, they know the city by, like the back of their hand. And if I'm hearing that we have the capacity to do this in-house by our own staff, um, I don't understand why why we would have discussions about um, hiring another consultant and spending more money when if the concern is really about being financially conservative. Well, time is money, and that's how I look at that. And so it's, you know, you get this, get this plan out there faster and quicker. And it would be staff going 30 miles an hour compared to a consultant going 75 miles an hour. So. Would hiring a consultant make the process go faster? Madam Mayor and Council Members, the, the, the primary duties for the staff planner uh, that would be to ensure that the consultant is following through on the scope of work, uh, monitoring the, uh, the contract, uh, but also, there would be some contributions, but for the most part, it's, it's the management of the contract and management of the consultant. Any other questions, Mr. Ng? Um, do we have any correspondence or requests to speak? Do we want to hear from the person who's yeah, yeah, I do. Yes, Madam Mayor. Staff received two letters in support of the general plan update and requests that the City Council consider other funding mechanisms to finance the general plan update instead of increasing building fees. One okay. letter is from the Santa Maria Valley Chamber of Commerce and the other is from Urban Planning Concepts. And uh, we have one request to speak and I believe Urban Planning Concepts would like to present the City Council with a few PowerPoint slides when they're invited to speak. Okay. And then we have someone here from Ramey. Okay. Okay. Um, why don't we hear hear from you first, and then Lori, I, then I'll hear from you secondly. <coughs> Ramey, yes. Uh. <coughs> Good evening. Hmm? Did you guys have specific questions or? Did, where was there a specific question? No, no, I just did, did know if you had something to say on that. No, I, I think the only thing I would add, um, and I'm worried to hear the, the letter, is that in terms of general plans, there are usually three mechanisms that are used. One is the general flat, the mm -hmm. general fund uh, monies. The second is a general plan maintenance fee. And the third is, is grant funding. And so uh, different jurisdictions take on different kinds of approaches. Sometimes it's a combination of three. So as you think about that, um, that's, that's usually what jurisdictions are, are sort of balancing out. So. Did, I'm sorry, did you give your name? No, my name is Monica Guerra. Okay. I uh, am a senior planner with Ramey and Associates. And okay. I will be the project manager for this team. OK, thank you. No problem, thank you. Um, Lori Tomorrow. Good evening. Uh, Lori Tomorrow mm -hmm. with the Room Planning Concepts. And uh, I'd like to just do, uh, with your indulgence, and I know it's late, but I'd like to step back a little bit uh, and uh, review a PowerPoint presentation with you, and I will talk very fast. <laughs> uh, so if you, if, um, oh God. Gonna give this to me. <laughs> okay. Uh, so these are our fathers who started the city. That's the corner. And uh, about tw uh, 26 miles. This is how the city grew, just out from Main and Broadway. And the population numbers are following right along with that. Um, some of the reasons were agriculture and oil in the early 90s, 1990s. Uh, in the, uh, 1909, that's when this, around the time the city incorporated and uh, started to establish boundaries and um, slowly building out the city. Uh, we had the railroad come in. Uh, Alan Hancock was here doing quite a few things for us. Uh, the city got a little bit larger. You can see a nice uh, square boundary and uh, the infill that's occurring. 
and um, again, Allen Hancock College and some of the stuff that was happening there. In the 1950s is when Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, really was taking off as Camp Cook, and we were dealing with a lot of stuff out there. And then, of course, they closed Camp Cook, and it took a while before Vandenberg was up and running again. But at that point, we were at about uh, 25,000, and I'm, I'm probably, there's some people thinking, I remember when. <laughs> um, an interesting exhibit, uh, in, two, in 1963, uh, a big event, 101 was moved from the center of town out into the hinterlands. And so what they did was uh, did a coordinated general plan with the county of Santa Barbara and the city of Santa Maria on what would this look like. Look at that map right now from 1963 and, you know, drawn with crayons and, you know, a, you know, different... It looks the same. Exactly. That is my point. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, what I want was to... And then you also had um, some additional development occurring at the northern portion of Santa Maria, but you can see as we start seeing the little throat going down off this map is when the city started to expand down and bring in um, the airport into the city boundaries. In the 80s, we had what was called the hourglass look to the city. We had basically one north-south running street and we had a bunch of um, dirt roads Blosser and Miller and College and Bradley running north south, but they weren't in the town. They weren't connecting. And so the city in 1989 started the general plan. These are the planning areas. This is the vernacular. This is how we planned in 1989 to move the city annexations and sphere boundary forward. And these lands have been developed. The only two that haven't been developed yet is Area 5B and the Mahoney Ranch, number seven. Mahoney Ranch is out towards the jail facilities, Tanglewood, and unfortunately, it is um, completely engaged with the tiger salamanders. It would be millions and millions and millions and millions of dollars to do the mitigation for tiger salamanders out there. And so even though it's in the city and it, could, and it has a specific plan and it could move forward, um, it's very unlikely that that will happen in the near future with the situation with um, endangered species. So you basically have one piece of property left to develop in the city of Santa Maria for the next couple of years, and that's Area 5B. Hopefully the EIR for that project will be released soon and we can move forward. But what I want to point out, oops, I'm sorry. See that list there? That's the list that Chunk just read off. In 1989, the city did exactly this. They brought in state water. They expanded the sewer plant. Every two years or every five years ever since, they, they redid every interchange. They built the library. They did the police. They did fire schools. We did a master plan that this city should be very, very, very proud of. And we implemented it, and it was a partnership between development and the city, and that included developer fees. And those fees have been paying as a partnership with the city for the last 30 years. Oh, there's uh, the city as it sits right now. And um, we need to start talking about what we're gonna do next. Of course, you can't see this, but this is directly from SB CAG's 2050 growth plan. And it says that Santa Maria, this county of Santa Barbara is gonna have 64,000 people. Santa Maria gets 35,000 to 40,000 in the next 30 years. So we need to start planning now. We should have actually started planning probably a couple of years ago. Now's the time to do it. But we do have constraints. We have agriculture around us. We know that there are those that will not be excited about Santa Maria growing into the agricultural areas. It's obvious it has to happen. We just have to do it right. We have tiger salamanders surrounding us. The feds will be involved in this process because they want to make sure that we mitigate for the tiger salamanders. But where are we going to go? We have two options. We go up or we go out or we do both. And 
It's not rocket science. Every one of us here in this room, the experienced planners, have done this before. And it's, we're vastly more technically advanced than we were 30 years ago. So I think that the effort here is two things for, three things for you. First of all, approve this contract tonight. Direct staff and the consultant to come up with an expedited timeline. Three and a half years is too long uh, for this effort. And thirdly, continue the discussion for a later date on funding this effort. Because the one thing that hasn't been brought before to staff is the successful program that was done the last time, which was you bill the landowners that get a direct nexus benefit from this process. I have the list here, and you probably was hand typed. These were all of the landowners that contributed to the update to the sphere boundary and annexation program the last time, and they all paid. Most of them all said, all paid. And reimbursed the city for their net benefit. And the thing is, is that when you're in the city of Santa Maria and you get a net benefit increase of density, you should pay for that. Because somebody doing a rezone general plan change right now in the city's process pays over $75,000 of developer fees, environmental review, extra studies, and that's not even the consultants involved in the project. So it would be a very big benefit for all of those landowners that are going to get, get increased densities to help pay for that increased density. Because they're going to get it. You know, we know that the downtown is going to be densified. We know that there's going to be lands that get higher density. So I think the effort should be to rethink, not chase little dimes and nickels on building permits. And we haven't even talked about the art tax. Where's Alex? There he is. The art tax that's coming up at the next meeting. We just keep piling on. You just passed all of those ordinances that your building official said it's going to be $9,000 for every home to have solar. It just, I would love to see an itemized building permit up here that shows what it's going to cost a future home with all of these added fees. Let's be more creative and think of other options besides just adding one more thing on a building permit. So um, I love this project. I want to see it move forward. And I think uh, we have a lot of opportunities ahead of us. And um, look forward to working with staff. And I thank you very much. And I'll be around to help. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one, one minute, Lori. Thank you. Lori, explain again the uh, build the land owners. Those are for landowners that want to create a new project within the city or? Okay, so let's use um, Pacific Crest, Berkview Gate. When, when they annexed Area 5 into the city, he went from agriculture to five units per acre. Mm -hmm. The city said, you, anybody that's being considered in the annexation areas are going to pay $500 an acre. We reviewed, at that time, 3,000 acres. That's $1.5 million. That was in $1989. That paid for this study. Uh, so, so there's ways of working through those landowners that have a net benefit from this process to offset the city process. Because if they have to come in and go through the annexation process by themselves, it will cost a million dollars by themselves. Dude, this, there's economy of scale here that the city needs to be looking at. And that, like I said, I have all the records mm -hmm. when this happened the last time, and I'd be glad to sit down with Chong and Jason and Ryan and, and come up with a formula that, first of all, what's really important is you get the money now. You don't wait 12 years from now. Mm -hmm. You get the money now as part of this process. So I think this is the way to go. Are there projects out there that you see could that we could get the money now? Or is there any examples out there that? Well, first of all, you have to decide through this through the review mm -hmm. which lands are going to be annexed. You know, we, everybody's talking about what's happening on the east side of the freeway. 
you know, Cal Giant, uh, Bradley Lance, uh, the area around um, Gugia's property and all Di Barnetti's. You get through all of these properties and you say, do you guys want to partner with us on this process? And they say yes, then they, you start figuring out how, what the buy-in is. But isn't there a 10-year um, wait to come out of the Williamson Act? 15. All of those, you look at the map and all of those lands are already out. They're out. Oh, they are, okay. All of the lands on the east side of the freeway have already, because oh, they're, they're out. They are the next generation. Oh, fantastic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, D. Barnetti says are. Bougie's is out. Cal Giant applied when uh, Laventana went in. I mean, you know, this isn't okay. something that's, a, it, you know, it's not a secret. <laughs> the city's going to grow on that side. Well, yeah. So people have been preparing. Well, I know I've been worried about uh, Marion Hospital because they're landlocked in. And the only way they can expand yeah. is, is right out by sway. So, um. so uh, again, I would ask just to, in closing, because I know it's late, direct staff to continue this effort, approve the contract, because it is a good contract. I read through all of the RFPs. I actually read through the three and made my recommendations to the city staff. And, um, and so I think it's something that's worth moving forward with now. And then um, we can come back in a month with some other options for funding. Mr. Park, can I just ask a question before yes. you sit down? Um, what kind of obstacles do you anticipate might occur with annexation, getting things through LAFCO and getting things through the Board of Supervisors? Do you think that the Board of Supervisors might look negatively at our annexing land for political purposes? Well, uh, I feel like I just had a flashback to the 80s and 90s because there were problems then too. There were challenges. The Environmental Defense Center was right at the table with all of this, you know. Uh, there was anti-ism in, in the 80s and 90s. But do you think Santa, Santa Barbara's going to take 35,000 people in their jurisdiction? Mm -hmm. Do you think, mm -hmm. um, you know, San Inez is going to want 25,000 people living in the San Inez Valley? They're going to go somewhere. And we have to bring the right project forward to them that says we did our due diligence, we did our environment, we did, we did our planning, we did we densified our downtown core, and we're asking for annexation of lands because we know that there's going to be Marion Hospital expanding. You know, there's there's probably five or six other government agencies that are looking already at land on the other side of the freeway. It's happening. You know, the Elks are out there. The high school went out there. It's going to keep happening. If it's planned, it'll happen well, and if it's not, we'll just see, start seeing piecemeal stuff happening on the other side of the freeway without a plan. So I think the, there's no question. The only issue that the county had last time, and it'll be the only issue now, is um, the tax exchange agreement. As long as everybody comes out of this hole, or semi-hole, they'll approve it. And LAFCO will approve it, because yeah. they did it the last time. That's the, we went through that with the ENUS project, right. with the, the tax, yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. We so it's, 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 a, it's a bureaucratic process. You bring on the right team, you, put, you move forward, and you move forward fast. So, and I'm getting too old to have this take too long. So. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Lori. Okay. Uh, questions? Questions? Yes. Thank you, Lori. I appreciate your insight um, and experience here in the city. Just wanted to offer some additional comments. Uh, you know, looking at those maps, it's interesting to see the city at a large level hasn't really changed a lot, right? I mean, a lot of those colors are, are really similar. Um, but I, I want you to think about the neighborhoods that you all live in and think about the parcels, uh, info opportunities, in addition to annexation. Those are all sites that we consider when we're looking at the general plan because we're not just looking at the city at the broad scale, we're also looking neighborhood by neighborhood. Where are those opportunities to maybe think about those 
people that are going to be coming in um, because we're also thinking about demographic change and we're also thinking about sustainability we're thinking about economic development and all those pieces are kind of coming together when we're looking at a general plan uh, and the other thing I want to put out there because uh, one thing that we were really interested in not only working here as part of the downtown streetscape plan but that we noticed uh, was really highlighted as part of the RFP is the community engagement. For us as a firm, the, the, that conversation that happens that leads up into the general plan is really important. So whether we're having a conversation about annexation, whether we're having a conversation about vision, guiding principles, goals and policies, that's not solely a technical decision. And I say this as a planner, we, there is definitely a technical component to the general plan and a lot of technical decision making that comes with that. Uh, there's a lot of technology. I, I can vouch for all of that. Uh, but if as, a, if as a council and as a community, you're really vested in that community engagement process, you know that it also takes time. And I can stand here and tell you, yes, we can uh, create a general plan in two years. but I'm going to say it's, it's not going to be a very good general plan process if we don't take the time to have that conversation with community, which includes not only your residents and your business community, but also with you, uh, to really figure out where do you want to be in, in 2040. And finally, uh, the general plan is really intended to have benefits for everybody in your community. And so ultimately, the decision about how you pay for it is, is yours. Um, really think about the benefits that it's going to provide for everybody. Uh, it's, the general plan, again, is thinking about your entire city in addition to potential areas for annexation. It's not just thinking about those potential projects that, that may be added. And so who that, who that burden fall, falls on. Um, so, and if you have any questions, I'm, I'm happy to answer them as well. Any questions? Any questions? Mr. Stilwell? Uh, Madam Mayor, thank you. Um, so fundamentally, I think we all see there's a lot of value in doing this project. And so fundamentally, the discussion tonight is, do we enter into the contract? And if so, how do we pay for it? And so the, the real crux of the issue here is, in order to approve the contract, we have to have the money to be able to pay for the contract, and we don't have the money in the budget to pay for it. And so then you're left with three options, either not do the work, um, to use your reserves, which we're strongly suggesting you're going to want those reserves over the next few years, or to um, identify some additional revenue source for it. And so that's where we came up with staff's recommendation to um, develop a fee, uh, or direct staff to include uh, into the um, upcoming fee study an additional fee to pay for the work and to be able to front load the money. And so that's that's really the question we have here today. It would be nice to be able to go forward with the contract, but we have to have the funding identified in order to do so. Yes, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Mr. Stilwell, is it possible to agree upon a, a concept tonight with one of the with one of the funding options that Mr. Ng gave us, and to still look at what Ms. Tamora says, and then put the brakes on that one and, and transfer that funding uh, option to uh, to something other than the three or five percent. Yes, you can um, direct to do tonight. What's uh, for example, what's in the resolution, which is what uh, Mr. Ng outlined. And you can uh, look at adjusting that as we move forward. As it, and there's a couple paths, right? So the half full, I would say, is with uh, when the maps developed and you recognize the parcels that are going to be developed. Um, follow the path outlined by Lori Tomorrow to work with those landowners to have them uh, recoup the cost of this effort, since they will have direct benefits to it. You know, the half empty is you can double the fees six years down the road when you're trying to maintain your basic levels of services anyway. Okay. I, I just I just didn't want to be locked in to, to one thing and, and then have something up, else come up that is better, yet I feel that there's an urgency here to, to get this thing underway, and that's on your part and, and over here. So... Um, I'll tell you, so far what I've heard, Mayor, I would be in favor of looking at this 
in a final form tonight, and I would be in favor of the 5%, uh, knowing full well that there's at least a, a possibility that we will be shifting that, that funding source to, to another funding source in the not too distant future. To Lori's future. golden pot. <laughs> yeah, the, the Lori plan. <laughs> Well, and then we can ask, her wait, 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 wait. Okay, Ms. Soto. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you know, it, as um, Laura tomorrow was up here giving us this great presentation, thank you. And, and I think I've heard it from you before already when we've met. <laughs> um, you know, it's, it was mind boggling to think that, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that the last time we updated the general plan was the year that I was born. <laughs> <laughs> oh, 1989, what a great year, right? Um, and so... See what you cause your population. <laughs> and so, you know, that's mind-boggling to me. And I, I, I want to make sure that as we continue to serve the residents of Santa Maria, as we continue to look at further developments, that we are not walking blindly. Because that's what my concern is. Um, and I think, Lori you put that into perspective really well that we we're going to be building developing annexing and OB pockets here and there with no um no vision no, no, no vision and no, and no input from our community i i you know and i think this notion of expediting the process i think that that to me just reiterates the urgency that our city has in starting this work um, but as the consultants have said, as our city staff has reiterated multiple times, I would hate for us to rush a process that shouldn't be rushed. If anything, when we're talking about the vision of Santa Maria for the next 20, 30 years, this is a process that needs to be done um, diligently and with um, full, um, you know, what is it? Um, in, in working hand in hand with the residents of Santa Maria, the business community, the development community, um, and it's 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 the community engagement piece that I'm understanding can't be rushed. Um, and so I am in full support of moving with the recommendation that the city staff has given us. Um, I'm also open to revisiting different funding options in the in, you know as we move forward. Um, but I, again, I don't believe that this is a process that we need to be rushing to get done in a two-year span. Um, and I don't believe that we are at a position right now where we can um, halt this process. Um, and I mean. Would that be legal? Is it legal for us not to update our general plan? We, we will be updating the general plan. It's a, just a function of timing. But we have, no we have obligations to yeah. complete certain portions with, by the state of California, and we will meet right. those mm -hmm. deadlines. Right, and, and that's what I saw from, I think, the presentation, right? Like 1990-something, 2006. Yeah. That's because we've been updating it here and there, I'm assuming, but no overall vision. Mr. Waterfield. Yeah. Um, I have a question. In regards to the funding process with what um, Mr. Cadero had mentioned, and I, I like the landowners, we, we need to talk to the landowners. If the landowners come in and we make that agreement, will the 5% increase go away? Yeah, that's a, that's that's, be up to yeah. the council at that point. And that's what I would want. Yeah. To make sure that that goes that goes away completely, mm -hmm. and I, you know, I'm not crazy about nickel and diming these little tiny little projects, mm -hmm. the patio or something like that, that you get eight and thirteen bucks from. That's pretty embarrassing, in my opinion. If, if we need money that bad, you know, it just, I, I'm just not, I'm not for that at all whatsoever. And what I mean, and I. I agree with you for the development sense just because I keep talking about affordable housing and how difficult it is for, for developers to build. And I wouldn't want an additional cost to be another hurdle or another obstacle for us to build fast enough or build affordable housing. But um, I think that nonetheless, I think that this project tonight needs to be approved. We need to move forward with it. And I'm open with finding other funding streams. Dr. Motes. Well, I favor going forward with the plan that was presented this evening as quickly as possible and uh, with whatever funding mechanism seems expedient. Okay, 
Okay. Um, I, I, oh, I'll yeah. go ahead, Mr. Cordero. Th thank you, Madam Mayor. I, I seem to recall this young lady saying that one of the components when they start out is to uh, interact with the public. Is that right? Mm -hmm. And that's that's a concern that Ms. Soto has expressed that we need to hear from from our uh, our our interested population that that can come forward and say, well, I, well, I want to see this, or I want to see that, or, or I don't want to see this. So, so there is already a plan to communicate directly with the citizens of Santa Maria to Absolutely. see where they want to go as well. Mm -hmm. yep. Is, is that workshops. right? There's workshops. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. There will be uh, focus groups. There are interviews. There's, there's a pretty extensive engagement process, again, based on what we heard initially in the RFPs yeah. as okay. something that was important. Okay, and then I just want to point out that it's funny that we think in different directions. She thought that this was last updated on the year that she was born, and when they mentioned the year 1990, I'm thinking, Jesus, I'll be 91. So uh, we all have a different thought process, and I, I probably won't be involved too much at that time. You can have it. Yeah, um, I, and I know that we, during the recession, we didn't have the money to go forward, and we had talked about this for a while. So I'm really excited that we're going ahead with this because we need to plan how we've got so much housing we need to do. We need low income, we need workforce housing, and we've got to get going on getting this built. And, you know, and, and we'll, we, the arena numbers will be coming out soon, I'm sure, and, and so we've got to have that plan so we know where to, it's like a puzzle. You've got to be able to put everything in the right place so that it all fits together. So um, I'm really excited. I don't know where we're gonna get the money. <laughs> It's like taking this big fancy vacation, but I don't know how I'm going to pay for it. Credit cards. <laughs> the credit card, yeah. Um, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm really excited about this. Well, it's Thank nice you. to know we have some options in front well, of us. And, and, you know, and, and I understand what Ms. Waterfield is saying, because if you have someone that's planner is that, that, that your firm can contact all the time in the city to keep this moving along, because there have been times with projects, things get delayed and delayed and delayed. And, you know, one time we didn't have, have anything going on in Santa Maria. Nothing was building. Then we started building. And then um, we, we, we couldn't take care of everyone fast enough. And I, I felt sorry for our planners because we didn't have enough to go around. So that, that's the part I, I see as being expedited so it runs, it runs really smooth. I know it takes time because all the focus groups and the stakeholders, but I, I, think, it's, I think it's really a, it's overdue. Madam Mayor, if I may, I have yes, one more ahead. question. Um, you you mentioned, um, or you, you touched on um, the uniqueness of our city and the um, different populations, and I just want to make sure that as, I mean, a big part of this is really community engagement, and so I want to make sure that, um, that this these workshops will be done in Spanish, English, um, and in the need of indigenous interpretation indigenous language inter interpretation. So just as, I mean, to, as, as an example, when we did the downtown streetscape plan, um, we did have a Spanish translation available. Um, there were some workshops that we did with the Michteco population. It was actually much easier to go via the, the school meetings than having them come out to our forums. And so they had interpretation available. And so we, we try to be nimble and we try to be responsive to, to community needs uh, and also to make sure we know the right people in the community to, to, to connect to. Um, because we also know that not every, not the same people are going to show up to every space that we offer. And so trying to be understanding of, of what those spaces are for different different parts of your community. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. OK. So did we kind of sort of make a motion there when I mentioned that, Mayor? Is there, is there some more discussion motion, on the 5%? I didn't hear a motion unless let, I was let falling Let me make asleep. a motion, and I, I will add into it. I was in the middle of making up a correct so you're, Okay, <laughs> so. <laughs> I don't know, I just thought you were babbling, I'm sorry. Uh, I'd like to uh, make a motion to adopt a resolution approving a contract with Rami and Associates to develop a comprehensive update to the general plan and approving a general plan maintenance fee to be included in the citywide fee study update. Uh, this is also to include options, uh, different options of funding that we can look at with uh, the property owners. And did we decide on a fee, a percentage of the fee? Five. That's what I was getting to, but you interrupted me, so Five. we'll go from there. So, 
did you decide? I Split mentioned bets? already that I think we ought to go with the five percent. Okay, is that? Are we mm -hmm. all in agreement? Okay, with a five percent fee. I second. That's it. Okay. I have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Madam Clerk, could you please call the roll? Councilmember Waterfield? Aye. Councilmember Soto? Aye. Councilmember Motes? Aye. Councilmember Cordero? Aye. Madam Mayor Patino? Aye. So, let me ask you, oh. Mr. Stillwell, will we come back to agendize um, to, to talk about the funding part of it, because I think we need to spend some time on that. Yeah, thank you, Madam Mayor. So the work can get underway now with the contract with the consulting group and our, on our staff, and then the direction we have is to um, hear what you said as far as the fee to recoup the cost and to have our fee study analyst um, review that and come up with the actual cost. Those will come back to the council and you'll have a further discussion about them. For, and you. you'll actually approve the fee specifically. Okay, thank you. Next item will be a report by our city manager, Mr. Stillwell. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor and the members of the council. The next meeting of the city council is November 19th. And uh, four items of note are the um, semi-annual Going the Extra Mile Employee Award, and we'll present that. Um, we'll have, we propose to have the first reading of the ordinance for art program, first reading of the vaping and flavored tobacco ordinance, and the model lease 2020 mobile home, uh, enforceable mobile home model lease um, for council in consideration. That concludes my report. Thank you. So, oral reports of council members. We'll start with you, Mr. Cordero. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On the uh, 21st of last month, I attended another uh, CCAP meeting at the school district and uh, once again I'm pleased to see that they've applied a business model to it uh, they're they're working real hard to get the scores up for the people in our yeah, the young people in our in our school district on the 22nd I was uh, privileged to hear the state of the city information by uh, Mayor Patino and uh, Jason Stillwell and it's nice to hear that we're doing fine but there is some caution there and we're, there's some concerns about uh, the unknown costs that have not come to us yet. On the 23rd uh, I uh, served at the Empty Bowls and that's becoming a larger and larger project every year and it was really nice and, and a lot of, met a lot of fine, saw a lot of fine mm -hmm. people there. On the uh, 27th, I uh, was at the uh, funeral services at the church for uh, Rod Rottenberger. And on the 27th, I was fortunate enough to attend the celebration of a 60-year anniversary for Pastor Ori Johnson and First Lady Gladys Johnson at a church up on North Railroad. It, uh, it was amazing. The, the people in this particular parish, in this church, they could film that and sell it as a 1970s or 80s uh, uh, jazzer size thing. These people were all over the church uh, singing and dancing and they were just happy folks. And it was a, it was a real pleasure and it was a real honor uh, for me to be there to, to see this fine special man off uh, into his retirement and to hear the words of the mayor. Uh, I was mayor got there unfortunately a little bit late and I was thinking God the city should say something and then she came walking in and I said all right we're gonna get a chance to say something so uh, and then on the on the 27th also excuse me I, I attended those two events and then on the uh, uh, November the 4th uh, yesterday I was here at the City Hall attending the uh, mm -hmm. kickoff for the Toys for Tots and um, on the second, uh, I attended the uh, celebration of life for Rod Roddenberger at the San Marie Inn, and I will say that he was uh, one of the law enforcement giants of yesteryear, and it was very well attended, and uh, a lot of really nice things were said about one of the uh, icons of law enforcement here in San Maria Valley, and it was a pleasure to get up and speak there. The only reason I spoke was to validate uh, one of the things that his family said about a neighborhood incident where the police were called, and I was a very young policeman at the time, and it generated um, uh, 
a lot of uh, laughter uh, on his behalf. And that's it for me, Mayor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Dr. Motes. On October 22nd, I went to the State of the City breakfast at the Radisson, and I found it to be very instructive. On the 27th, I went to the uh, Rosary for Rod Rodenberger. And uh, Rod and I kind of knew each other through athletics. He was just kind of at the end of his running career when I was starting mine. And uh, my very first marathon in 1985, my wife and I and Rod and fellows all went up to San Francisco together. And he took us to what he thought were the finest Italian restaurants. And uh, Phyllis and I stayed together till about mile 16, when my youth took over, and I did go ahead of her a little bit, but we both, sure. wore, we both wore those marathons. This is my first marathon. That's a big deal. So I wore that marathon medal all weekend. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Thank you. Miss Waterfield. And his son, Matt, is quite an athlete. He used to be running with big chains around his neck. Have you ever seen him? He's oh crazy. Oh, gosh. He, he gets two five-gallon bottles of water, puts them on his shoulders, and, and goes runs. jogging. Yep. And I'm yep. thinking, I couldn't carry him from here to where he is, let alone. He's got to have strong knees. Oh. I don't know. I don't think he does that anymore. <laughs> <laughs> um, on Wednesday, October the 16th through Friday, October the 18th, I attended the League of California Cities in uh, Long mm. Beach with a few of my colleagues here. On Tuesday, October the 22nd, I attended the State of the City, and uh, that was the morning. That afternoon, that afternoon, I met with Dr. Walters uh, from Allen Hancock regarding some funding for the college. On Wednesday, October 23rd, I attended the Empty Bowls, and I served at the Empty Bowls, and it's just um, a great uh, function to attend to. Thursday the 28th, I attended the Central Coast Water Authority meeting, and um, there's uh, a lot of expense coming through that uh, we, we don't see yet, and we opted out on, on, on a few of those because they were, they were just, uh, when you talk about billions of dollars, you don't want to put any debt on the city when you do something like that. Later that afternoon, I attended the quarterly awards luncheon at Vandenberg Air Force Base. On Saturday, October 26, I attended CoLab, and uh, that was over in San Ynez, and it was just a nice company with about 700 people, and I'm sure Mr. McNeely was happy I, I was there. And um, October 28th, I attended the community forums to address homeless. That was on Monday the 28th. On Tuesday, the 29th, I attended um, a meeting with John Fowler to, to discuss H-2A affordable housing. And Mr. Fowler is, um, does the, uh, people. the people self-help, self -help. which is anything they do is, is awesome. So I, I, I love what they do there. So it's great. Um, October 30th. I attended the Elected Leaders Forum in San Ynez to address homelessness. And later that evening, which we don't have the pictures, uh, I attended the uh, trunk or treat at the police department. And there had to be a thousand people there. I know Mark, uh, Mark Vandicap got the pictures. I just checked with Mark's Commander Schneider. And so we were supposed to have these pictures up here to, um, to get that going. I, I just want to show the public that when you've got a thousand people and a lot of them are children and their families and grandparents and everybody coming in, it shows what a great police department we have and how everyone is just so excited to be around our police. They're, they're not a threat. You take one incident where you only get the half message on it, you don't get the full story on it, and I just don't want our community to think that is our police department. That's why I wanted the trunk and treat uh, pictures up here, because that was very important for the public to see. Um, and then, nope, I didn't go to that one. Oh, yesterday, I attended a really 
great, interesting meeting over at Pacific Christian Church, and it's about, it's with Teen Challenge. I don't know if anybody knows what Teen Challenge is, but they want to put a chapter here in Santa Maria, and it helps, it helps the youth dealing with drugs and alcohol, and they do have a pathway out of it. And, uh, you know, I, I've always claimed that the problem we have with homelessness is, is drug and mental. And this teen challenge could help a lot of these youth not become homeless by dealing with their drug and alcohol problem and their mental problems too. It's a Christian-based program. It's worked all over the United States. And there is a lot of kids that we could help here in Santa Maria and in Lompoc. And um, I'm looking forward to continuing with that. And that's it. Ms. Soto. Thank you, Madam Mayor. On Wednesday, October 16th through the 18th, I attended the League of Cities annual conference. On October 22nd, I um, went to the State of the City. Great job, Mayor, Jason, everybody involved. It was awesome. Um, that same afternoon, I um, did a photo, con a photo contest judging through um, FSA. I then had a census meeting with um, where I invited all of the um, county cities and staff to get together so that we can work on the county implementation plan for the census. Um, I, on Wednesday, 20, Wednesday, October 23rd, I attended the Empty Bowls event at, um, where I helped serve soup. Um, let's see. On October on October 28th was um, FSA's open house, and that's when they announced the winners of the photo contest. It was, they were so appreciative of the city of Santa Maria supporting their efforts, and so they gave us a really big thank you there. Um, that was really nice. On Wednesday, October 30th, they, um, I attended the Elected Leaders Forum to address homelessness and solving. Um, great discussions around um, getting stats about um, who our homeless population um, folks are. Um, it was fascinating to learn that the vast majority of people who are homeless um, became homeless here in, here in our county, and that a lot of them continue to live within like a five mile radius of where they once lived. Um, and really dismantling myths and misconceptions about um, homelessness and really s talking about how the reason for homelessness is um, the lack of, of affordability housing and not being able to pay their bills. Um, so that was really fascinating. And then from there, I rushed back to Santa Maria to the trunk or treat. Great job, our police department. It was awesome. I even got to take some candy home, so that was nice. And then on Thursday, October 31st, I attended um, the Places for Bikes workshop in Santa Barbara, and that's where they um, invited also elected leaders um, so that they can talk about how we can make our cities more bikeable and walkable more bikeable and pedestrian friendly. Um, and I will brag, I did brag, um, that our city was the only city in the county that scored 75 out of 100. Mm -hmm. And that's because all of our residential zones are within like a mile or two mile, to mile radius from a commercial zone. So now if we can just build like a bike lane from one end of college to the other. I mean, maybe we'll get 100 or 80. I mean, it was pretty exciting to see that we scored so high. Oh, I like green. Wait, is that your favorite color? It's my favorite color for a bike lane. Oh. <laughs> They've got green bike lanes in San Luis Obispo. Oh, yeah, that's it. I mean, I'll invite you to the meetings. I'm building a little coalition. Oh, that's it. Thank you. That's it? Okay. Um, October 16th through the 18th, I attended the League of Cities annual conference in Long Beach. On the 19th, I was there for the Santa Barbara County Veterans Stand Down at the Fair Park. Um, it, you know, it's really, it's, it's always amazes me how many of our agencies from the city of Santa Maria and the county come out to that, so they provide services to our veterans. And I got my flu shot, too. And on the October 20th, I presented a car at the Central Coast Orthodontics giveaway, which means I pulled the ticket out of the little bowl. On October 22nd, uh, Jason and I did the State of the City event at the Radisson Hotel. 
attended Rotary, and then I spoke to the grand jury in the afternoon. I met with the grand jury. On the 23rd, served at the Empty Bowls event. They really have this down really now, so that they have all the soups coming in, and they had a lot of good soups. I didn't taste one that I didn't like. And uh, that evening went to a, the Chick-fil-A leader, uh, leader Academy at the Manami Community Center with uh, some of our youth on October 24th. Attended the Taxpayers and Industries Economic Action Sum Summit in Solvang. Went to the CDBG Grant Pre-Application Workshop at Shepherd Hall. On the 25th, I attended the Rosary for Rod Rodenberger. On the 26th, did the Special Olympics North Divisional Fall Games at Hagerman Complex. On the 27th, Dia de, the, Dia de los Muertos uh, Family Festival at the Veterans Community Park. On the 28th, I was went to, I had to drive to Santa Barbara um, for the City Selection Committee meeting for SB CAG. On the 30th, attended the Elected Leaders Forum to address homelessness in Solvang, and then came back to the Trunk or Treat, the Santa Maria Police, State, Police Department. And this was a brainchild of Sonia Sandoval, one of our police officers who put this together, and she thought it would be a great idea to do. And I guess they probably had close to 1,000 kids. And these kids are all dressed up. Some of the parents are dressed oh, up. Dressed yeah, up. but the kids are all, actually all dressed up. It was cute. Uh, the 31st, I attended SPE October 31st with the lunch meeting at the Far Western. November 2nd, um, a Rotary did the Sips and Sombreros, Sombreros event at the Elks Lodge. Susie Rigetti got our Don Melby Award, and I was felt privileged to present that to her. And let's see. Oh, and on the third, the San Maria Civic Theater Pioneer Tribute to Meg Smith. And I brought the little thing. Meg has done started the Civic Theater here in San Maria, has done so much uh, as far as promoting theater. She and Tom both both artists in their own realm. And um, they showed a, a clips of the different um, actors that she's known throughout the years. And and Phil and Brynn, her son, was there. So it, it was very, uh, I, there was a lot of people that are involved in the Civic Theater. Uh, they asked me if I wanted, if I was interested, because, you know, George Hobbs was mayor one time. He was involved in the Civic Theater. I saw him in a couple of the plays years ago. Yes, yes, yes. Um, November 4th, did to Toys for Tots kick off in front of City Hall. Attended the Adult and Teen Challenge informational meeting at Pacific Christian. And then last night went to the Key Club Social at the Maldonado Center, did the Ben Hayes Radio Show today, and attended Rotary. And this evening, I would like to um, close the meeting in memory of Rod Rodenberger, who served on the city's Recreation and Parks Commission for 17 years. And um, his mantra was, plan your work and work your plan, much like we did tonight. So he was involved with many of the city's successful projects, including the Hagerman Sports Complex, the L1 Muscle Senior Center, the Abel Maldonado Community Youth Center. Um, Rod has been um, part of Santa Maria, he and Phyllis, and I can remember going to Mass you know, years and years ago, and they would all come in with all the kids in, into church. And I just wanted to read briefly part of his obituary. Uh, it said he began his law enforcement career, regretted that he couldn't spend more time with his children for he felt the need to work a second and sometimes a third job to meet his obligations and put food on the table for his growing family. And when you hear his family talk about how much their dad meant to them and how much fun he was to have around, it sounded like they, that there was a lot of quality in their home. He. Um, Holds a long-standing batting average record of 508 with the team and was named MVP of the Central Coast League in 1955. In 1968, the Office of Marshal for the Courts of Northern Santa Barbara County, an elect office, was open and Rod ran for the post and his victory began another phase in his service for law enforcement. <coughs> Received numerous awards and accolades for his services in the county and the city of Santa Maria including from the California State Legislature. 
He was very proud of his lifetime membership with the ORCID PTA for work with the ORCID schools, served proudly as a member of the chairman for the San Rio Parks and Recreation Department, and he meant so much to so many people uh, in Santa Maria. And um, I know that you wanted to say a few words, Mr. Thank Perkins. you, Madam Mayor. Just to relate one of the stories that his family told, that on Sundays they would go for rides, and there's a, there's a, there's a road up in Nipomo that they would always take, and it had these dips in it, these uh, uh, casual dips. And he told these kids that he's going to put the rocket on, and he would go really fast, yeah. and they would go up and down and up and down, and that was a big deal for that was a big deal for him and his family. And as a as a retired law enforcement officer, I'm proud to stand on the shoulders of him. Thank you very much. So I would like to adjourn tonight's meeting in the memory of Rod Rodenberger, who meant so much to the city of Santa Maria. Thank you.